needing to switch their TV sets from analog to digital, that from Reuters. Congress ordered the switch to go in effect next February to free public airways for emergency uses. Here's more about the transition from a House hearing on the subject with testimony from FCC Chairman Kevin Martin. This is three and a half hours. Good morning. Uh, today, we hold yet another oversight hearing on the status of the digital television transition. The goal of today's hearing is to extract lessons from the recent test in Wilmington, North Carolina, to assess ongoing governmental efforts towards a successful transition, to examine consumer education initiatives and ways to improve them, as well as to raise other policy issues affecting the future of digital television. This subcommittee has held several hearings, this Congress, <clears throat> on the transition to focus attention on the preparations and policies necessary to ensure success. In addition, I tasked the Government Accountability Office over two years ago with the job of examining this transition and uh, all it has done uh, in, it, uh, uh, in a very, very excellent way by the GAO. Um, and this top-notch job uh, has delved into the governance, technical, and consumer education aspects of the transition. This morning, we receive a fresh report from the GAO on the status of transition efforts. With 154 days left until the shutoff, we need to gauge current consumer and industry preparedness for this transition. We are also eager to provide and receive suggestions for additional outreach or policy improvements to minimize consumer disruption, particularly for the elderly, individuals with disabilities, minority households, and Latino households along the border with Mexico. Since our last hearing <clears throat> on this important subject, we have had the pilot test in Wilmington this isolated test was a valuable experience. It demonstrated that with focused efforts, general awareness of the transition in a relatively small market can be raised to fairly high levels. However, just below the general awareness, detailed consumer knowledge about how to properly hook up converter boxes, put up antennas, or take other similar steps necessary to receive the new digital channels was apparently deficient. In addition, other North Carolina households suffered from loss in the coverage areas of particular broadcast stations where the digital signal failed to reach historically served households. These in-home implementation issues and for many consumers, unexpected signal loss caused understandable confusion and frustration. Chairman Martin, in my view, correctly stated after the test that the measure of success isn't Wilmington per se but rather how we learn from Wilmington to ensure success next February. I want to commend the Commission, the NTIA, and non-governmental stakeholders for their efforts in Wilmington. To address the specific problems identified in the Wilmington test, however, will undoubtedly prove challenging on a national scale. To extrapolate what might happen nationally from this test may be difficult, but it is clear that a fairly significant number of consumers in Wilmington called stations or the FCC with implementation problems at home. Moreover, <clears throat> if coverage areas of broadcasters purposefully shrink or are otherwise diminished in more densely populated markets than Wilmington, consumer ire from both of these issues could come from hundreds of thousands or millions of consumers nationally next February. We must also be cognizant of the fact that Wilmington received extraordinary attention and resources for this test. Such a focused effort will be difficult to replicate on a national scale. The good news is that we have 154 days left prior to the national analog shutoff. The bad news is that we have only 154 days left prior to the shutoff. That leaves us precious little time for the FCC, the NTIA, and the industry to make final preparations and contingency plans for several key aspects of the transition. I look forward to hearing from 
our witnesses, and I thank them for joining us uh, this morning. <clears throat> um, the ranking member of uh, the committee will be here uh, momentarily. He's been delayed with an, an important uh, matter, but uh, perhaps at this point I could recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, for his opening statement. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your uh, due diligence in uh, tracking uh, the rollout uh, and the preparedness. And frankly, I've been very pleased in our community, uh, the Omaha area, all, all of our over-the-air TV stations, uh, including the NETV station, Nebraska Educational Television stations, as well as all the networks. Seems like you can't go an hour or two without them uh, running a PSA. Uh, our community has been very involved. Uh, we have United Way uh, advertising their 211 number if anyone has any questions. Also at the teleservices uh, 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 in our community, uh, some of our uh, teleservices corporations have been contracted by NTIA to be able to accept the telephone calls from the consumers. Uh, the same entities uh, that work with other government agencies that uh, when we're going to receive volumes of calls. So I think uh, we're getting the message out. We're becoming prepared. Uh, and uh, most people understand. There are some issues that arise. Uh, first of all, we want to make sure that our teleservices uh, that are going to be the first line of communication between the government and the consumers are adequately funded and the contracts are in place. Uh, secondly, with uh, some of our NETV already switching over to digital only, uh, we are learning some of the same lessons in Wilmington in that uh, the distance of the signal uh, seems to be different than the analog where the cliff, uh, where they would receive some picture before they're receiving no digital picture, and we're receiving calls, and of course we're working with them to try and get the power booster antennas up. Uh, again, that's just an additional cost to the consumer. The other issue that we seem to have, and I'd like to hear this uh, from Secretary Baker, is uh, the coupons. We're getting calls from people that have lost or misplaced or even had purses stolen with their coupons in it, and they're finding it difficult. They're being told, no, once we send them to you, you don't get a replacement. And uh, I think those are rare, but I think we need to be flexible in the opportunity or uh, in our responsibility to make sure that the people who need a coupon, if it's been lost or stolen, uh, can be replaced. Uh, with that, uh, one last part in reaching out to our Hispanic community. I'm pleased that the FCC and TIA have sent, been sending people around to see how the rollout's going. You came to Omaha, uh, and we walked the Mercado, uh, handing out flyers and posters to make sure that we got the penetration within our Spanish-speaking human. Hispanic community. So I do think that we understand what the issues are and are doing an adequate job of addressing those. I yield Great. back. Great. <clears throat> Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez. Wait, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for holding this hearing and also to the panel witnesses for the opportunity to discuss uh, the progress of digital television. First, I'd, uh, I'd like to congratulate both Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, and community leaders and Chairman Martin uh, for the successful transition to digital television. Uh, there were concerted efforts by broadcasters, federal agencies, grassroots organizations, service providers, community leaders, and retailers to educate uh, Wilmington residents about the early transition date. Uh, while these efforts, as we all know, were basically successful, the FCC, you, you did receive over 800 calls about the transition. The calls ranged from consumers who had no prior knowledge of the transition, consumers who had issues with the converter box um, coupon program, as uh, Representative uh, uh, Terry was uh, speaking about, and consumers who had technical issues with either the converter box or reception. Using the Wilmington calls as a basis, the national DTV transition could spur millions of calls. The FCC call center should be prepared for a large influx of calls after February the 17th. 
I hope that all resources can be harnessed nationally to provide the same level of consumer saturation for the DTV national, trans, uh, DTV national transition as we saw in Wilmington to reduce or prevent confusion in calls on the day of transition. All entities, including Congress, must continue to provide consumer education, and I encourage new organizations to get involved uh, so we can reach all populations. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I yield back the rest of the remainder of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the ranking member of the uh, subcommittee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, glad to be here for this hearing. Um, I don't know what number hearing this is for the DTV transition, but Obviously, the more the merrier, especially after our demonstration in Wilmington. And I th thought it was a great success. Uh, I noticed in the hearing, Mr. Chairman, that you have uh, nine witnesses on the second panel. So I hope we all can stay for those nine witnesses. Um, it's 154 days away from the transition. And I believe consumers are well prepared uh, for this transition. As of early August, uh, 91% uh, of households had one or more television with a digital tuner or connected to a pay service or converter box, according to Nielsen. Uh, almost 80% of households, every television had a digital tuner or was connected to a pay service or a converter box. Thus, with more than six months still to go, uh, only about 8.9% uh, of households were relying exclusively uh, on analog over the air television still needed to take action. Uh, to continue watching television during the trans for the for the transition. As of early September, 10 million coupons had been redeemed, and another seven and a half million coupons were still in circulation. 156 converter box models, different models, have been approved for purchase with the coupons. 82 of which can pass through the analog signal um, of low power st for low power stations. While a converter box cannot display digital programming in high definition on an analog television, it will improve the video and audio and will also enable the analog television to receive digital multicast programming over the air for free. Advanced non-coupon eligible converter boxes are also available, such as the ones that include digital recording features. While the NTIA sends coupons, it includes a list of participating stores that are near and close to the customer. So far, the NTIA has certified 2,300 retailers with a total of 29,000 stores locations to participate in the program. Consumers can also redeem coupons with 35 online retailers and 13 phone retailers. It's also worth Worth noting that consumer satisfaction with a converter box is off the charts. Retailers say they have never seen electronic devices with such low return rates. Another positive aspect of the transition was the apparent success of the September 8th test transition in Wilmington, North Carolina. By all early indications, the test went well, less than one half of 1 percent of the 180,000 television households in the Wilmington area called the FCC with questions that day, indicating that most consumers were ready and able for the transition. Of the 797 calls, 797 calls, most were from viewers who were aware of the transition and who had obtained the converter boxes but did not know how to scan channels or perhaps did not have the right antenna to use with the converter box. Another positive development from the Wilmington test was that churches, firefighters, and other local groups were helpful in getting the word out and helping consumers to install the converter boxes. A number of students from nearby Elon University also helped local broadcasters and cable operators take phone calls and answer questions. In light of this information, government and industry should now focus their consumer education efforts on exclusively over-the-air households, should encourage consumers to try their converter boxes early, sort of a simulated test, and should educate them on how to set up the boxes and their antennas. Local broadcasters should also work with churches, firefighters, schools, and other grassroots groups to help prepare consumers and answer the phones with questions. 
uh, to answer their questions. So, Mr. Chairman, as you can see, we're on the right track. Uh, this does not mean that we can rest completely at ease. There will always be some people that have trouble. Uh, as we get closer to February 17th, uh, 2009, we need to remain extra vigilant to ensure that the transition goes just as smoothly as possible. Uh, these are important issues. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, your consistent attention to the uh, DTV uh, transition. I think that um, uh, the ranking member expressed it well when he said, uh, I don't know what uh, number of uh, uh, this hearing represents, but there have been a lot of them. I think for all the years that I've been on this committee, we've been dealing with uh, um, moving up to this moment. So um, the time is just about at hand. Uh, last week, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, transitioned early as a part of the FCC's uh, test market. The FCC provided local viewers with a 1-800 helpline, um, which is good. And based on the analysis of those calls, 19 percent of all callers said that they had some difficulty with the converter box. Uh, based on these numbers, um, I, I think that um, we might not be adequately explaining how to install the converter boxes. I think that uh, that's what it points to. So I'm eager to hear from our witnesses today uh, how these numbers are being analyzed and if there will be changes to the outreach programs based on uh, the data that was secured from this. Uh, uh, I also want to call attention to the number of calls. The FCC estimates that uh, 14,000 households in Wilmington only receive free over-the-air broadcasts. In five days, there were 1,828 calls. So I think it's fairly safe to assume that the vast majority of those callers are free over-the-air households. I, I don't know if that's a correct assumption, but I'm assuming that. And that means that about 13 percent of those households had an issue. If those numbers translate nationally, um, the helpline is going to be flooded with more than a million calls in a few days um, after the transition. So uh, my question that I hope you'll address is, is the transition in place to adequately, re, uh, adequately respond uh, to all of those calls. Um, it's also come to my attention that uh, on December 31st of this year, a substantial number of retransmission consent agreements are going to expire. If recent history is any guide, there's a significant risk uh, that more than a few of the stations covered by these agreements could go dark on cable networks in January, just ahead of the transition date. I support a quiet period uh, beginning before the end of this year and extending for a reasonable period of time after the transition date to ensure that consumers are not subjected to additional confusion and disruption. So I hope and I urge uh, both the broadcasters and the cable operators to quickly negotiate these consent agreements well uh, before or after the transition date. Um, I'm afraid that there will be some confusion and uh, we don't need any added confusion uh, of a retransmission consent dispute that would, I think, really hurt consumers uh, preceding the transition. So, Mr. Chairman, I think these hearings have been enormously helpful both to us and to the agency that has to implement uh, the change. And um, I look forward to um, asking questions and thank all the witnesses for being here. Yield Gen back. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to put my written statement into the record. Um, I commend you for holding the series of hearings on digital transition. It appears to be going well. I appreciate our uh, panelists being here, especially the Chairman of the FCC, um, Chairman Martin. And with that, I yield back. I will point out the Cowboys beat the Eagles last night, 41 to 7, 37. And how about those Patriots without Tom Brady? They're pretty amazing. Wasn't that something? Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, we were in a state of depression until, you know. Did the Cowboys play the Patriots this year? In, in the Super Bowl. In the yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, gotta, we'll, see. we'll talk. <laughs> uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman for, from uh, Michigan, chairman of the committee, Mr. Dingle. First of all, I commend you for the hearing. 
and for your long-standing and continuing interest in the, in the subject matter of this hearing. It is going under your leadership to be, I'm satisfied, a most helpful event. I welcome the witnesses to the committee's sixth hearing on this matter of digital television and the transition. As I have said before, DTV transition is a critical consumer issue facing the committee this year, and it is essential that we continue to address outstanding issues as February 17, 2009 draws closer. Just a week ago, stations in Wilmington, North Carolina transitioned to digital. These stations deserve commendations as do cable, satellite providers, and the DTV Transition Coalition, NTIA, and the Federal Communications Commission for their efforts. The DTV transition tests evaluated and revealed many problems, including consumers who could not collect their, uh, connect their converter boxes to, tele, to the televisions and did not know they needed to rescan their boxes to search for new channels nor, and did not know they needed to obtain or adjust antennas to receive digital signals. These are warnings to us that must be heeded. In Wilmington, the FCC paid the fire department to make house calls to help connect the converter boxes, a very forward-looking step. I look forward to hearing from Chairman Martin as to whether the FCC will have the resources to provide such assistance nationwide and whether it will be desirable. We will also need to know what it is that he and the Commission learned from this part of the experience and all the rest. If not, we will have to call on FCC, NTIA, the DTV Transition Coalition, state and local governments, community organizations, consumer groups, retailers, manufacturers, broadcasters, cable and satellite providers, and others with a stake in this transition to work together to assure that appropriate information and when needed in-home assist, in assistance are available to those who need help in setting up converter boxes and acquiring or adjusting antennas. I will also be expecting that the, cons that the broadcasters will inform viewers, as they have been doing, uh, that they will not, uh, if they will not be maximizing their digital signals until after the transition. We cannot have an, a repeat of the problems from Wilmington when the nation transitions on February 17, 2009. I am pleased that the hearing today will address issues raised by Ms. Solis's DTV Border Fix Act. This is a matter that needs the scrutiny of this committee, and there are problems there that do have to be addressed. Both the culture of the border region and the fact that the households there can often receive both U.S. and Mexican over-the-air signals are unique. And they are different than the problems that exist with regard to the Canadian border regions where I come from. These are also some of the poorest regions in our nation, making the coupon subsidy even more important to them. We must ask the FCC and NTIA to pay special attention to this region and their consumer education efforts and to look forward to working with Ms. Solis to ensure that we meet the needs of these communities which amongst other things else are largely bilingual. I'm also interested uh, in looking forward to hearing from Assistant Secretary Baker about NTIA's proposed legislation for additional administrator funds for the converter box coupon programs. I would like to hear why, if NTIA was prepared to recycle expired coupons, it did not budget sufficient administrative funds for that purpose. I'm also curious to know whether or not the contract that was let between NTIA and the contractor will uh, be able to accommodate the circumstances here. I also reiterate at this time what I have written NTIA before, that we cannot balance this planning error on the backs of consumers. I must confess myself much disappointed that NTIA's proposal is drafted 
so that each dollar spent to make up for NTIA's administrative shortfall is a dollar taken away from the funds set aside to provide coupons to the households that need them. That is a matter that will have to be addressed and I will be difficult to satisfy on this matter. For just 164 days remain until, I've said 164, 154, 10 days less, remain until February 17, 2009. We are then entering the home stretch. It is critical that we prepare for, understand, and be able to predict the problems and outstanding issues that are related to the transition so that no household is left behind and so that we are fully prepared to handle the matter efficiently and expeditiously and well. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for your leadership and for, hand, and for holding today's hearings. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman uh, yields back the balance of his time. Uh, we now turn and recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Deal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, pass and reserve my time for questioning. Great. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from, uh, gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Uh, Wald. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your having this hearing as we keep track of the DTV transition. Um, and I want to commend the, uh, the broadcasters and the cablecasters for aggressively uh, educating the American consumer about what's ahead. Um, I think they've done a terrific job in getting the word out. I, I can't turn on my own TV without seeing at least one message um, about the transition. And it appears from all the data that we have before us that indeed we're seeing a high success rate in conversions already and we've still got six months or five months to go. And so I'm, I'm real pleased with that. I do want to hear more about uh, the Wilmington transition situation. Um, I'm going to take the testimony. Unfortunately, I've got a uh, energy subcommittee hearing. It starts in about three minutes uh, and, a, and a classified briefing on the energy grid I'm going to have to step out for. And speaking of energy, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I, I guess I have to just express this. I know this is a DTV hearing. I'm just really disappointed the Speaker doesn't have as much respect for this committee as those of us who are on it have. And that we have a 299-page energy bill that was filed with the Rules Committee last night at 1045 that I doubt anybody on this committee seen or read that I understand is going to be on the floor today with no hearing and no markup. And it's really unfortunate that uh, the Speaker's decided to uh, run the House over the top of our distinguished committee chairs and the committee process and bring a 299-page bill to the floor today. And uh, I just want to say that I, it's really frustrating being on the Energy and Commerce Committee to have that happen. And I yield back to the my time. Gentlemen's well, time is Gentlemen, yield just for a moment. I, I would yield my colleague from Florida. I just follow up on that point. It's not only that, but the Rules Committee met and made sure that there are no amendments allowed. So in addition to um, closing down everything and preventing amendments, it's just be an up or down vote on a bill that we haven't seen. In fact, the bill that's going to be offered, I understand, is a little bit different than the summaries that have been circulated uh, in, but for both sides. So people on the Democrat side as well as Republican side have absolutely no idea what's in this bill. This is crucial to the long-term future of our country. So I think the gentleman makes an excellent point that in this kind of environment to see an energy bill come on the floor, close rule, <coughs> with no opportunity for anyone to uh, know what's in it is, is just a, a very sad situation. And, and I thank the gentleman. And reclaiming my time, not only is it sad, it, it's a, it, it, it so degrades the legislative process, in my opinion. Uh, if you can't do amendments, you can't see the bill, and you're required to vote on the biggest issue facing this country is energy. It's under, undermining our, our entire economy right now. Energy is the issue, and, uh, and it's one we need to deal with thoughtfully, carefully, deliberatively through the legislative process. That's what the 700,000 or thereabouts people I represent and each one of us represents expects out of us, not something filed in the, written in secret, filed in the dark at night at 1045 with the Rules Committee up at 10 o'clock today on the House floor, 299 pages, and I doubt anybody on either side of the aisle has read this. And so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I understand we have a, uh, a DTV uh, video clip that we've agreed to, to show. And so, if, uh, if that's possible. Well, the gentleman's time has expired. This All right. Um, Thank you, Mr. And, Chairman. And I'll, I'll be glad to show. Let me, let me just, else could why don't we just finish, you know, the, you know, we'll come back over to the side and 
No problem. Uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Well, I, I am. I feel badly that my Republican colleagues are sad, depressed, anxiety-ridden. I don't have any medication for that, but um, I can understand their depression. They have been voting on energy against every single way we have to break our addiction to foreign oil for the last several years. And today or tomorrow, they will be, and here's the joy. I will try to spread some joy here. Today, our Republican colleagues will be given another opportunity, their last opportunity of this Congress, to vote for solar energy instead of against it, to vote wind energy instead of against it, to vote for enhanced geothermal energy instead of against it, to vote for plug-in hybrid cars instead of against it, to vote for American ingenuity and innovation to develop a new clean energy, non-carbonized system instead of against it. They will get to vote for a 15 percent renewable portfolio standard instead of against it. They will get to vote for giving Americans a break when they buy plug-in hybrid cars instead of the oil companies a break when they put all their money offshore. They will get to vote for increased efficiency standards instead of against it. So they have some anxiety now, but I hope they will take the opportunity to join us today to really adopt a high-tech energy future for this country, and, I, and I'm sincere in that hope, and I think many of them will, and I think it will be a good day to move forward. Addressing the subject of this hearing, I do hope that we will hear today about how to help Americans understand how to actually apply this technology, the experiment that we've had have suggested there's some problems about that. I still think that we need to respond to this like we did to Gustav and the hurricane and not Katrina, and we're not done yet. And I hope we'll keep the eye on the ball to figure out a way to help Americans to actually get these things installed correctly. The test case demonstrates real weaknesses that, and I'll look forward to a discussion of whether we need that $7 million for flexibility to actually get the word out as well. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. You know, this reminds me of my favorite twin bill of all time was at the Harvard Square Theater about 30 years ago. It was Dr. No and Dr. Strangelove, two, you know, really, you know, great movies on a twin bill. Three dollars, you know, plus your popcorn, great. And you don't often get, you know, the the DTV and energy issues all in one hearing. So all of you, you know, it's all for the price of one admission to the same hearing. Let me turn and uh, <laughs> let me let me turn and uh, recognize now the gentle lady from uh, New Mexico uh, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also share the concerns of my uh, my colleague from Oregon. Um, you know, this used to be the premier committee in the House of Representatives. We worked on important issues. We spent, I mean, I remember markups here where, where we were here until 2 or 3 in the morning and there was a, you know, a series of hearts games going on in the back because we were working through legislation. We were debating things important to the country. And now we're going to take up an energy bill on the floor of the House that no one on this committee has even read. What are we here for? Uh, and uh, I just, uh, uh, I'm appalled at how the system has broken down in the Congress. The fact that the Congress is no longer functioning as a body that deliberates and passes legislation. So we just bring things to the floor that aren't going to become law. Nobody ever considers them. Nobody reads them. This is a joke. And it's made this committee a joke. And what I'm most disappointed in is that the leadership, the Democratic leadership of the Energy and Commerce Committee is allowing this to happen, is going along with this way of doing business. We had energy markups in 2001 and 2005 and 2007 that went on for days in this committee. But we worked it through, we considered amendments, and we legislated. That's what people sent us here to do. We're abdicating our responsibility. And this, you know, we might as well close down this committee if that's the way we're going to run things. So today we're going to talk about DTV. I'm not sure this committee would ever do anything if the Democratic leadership decided they wanted to change something about the DTV bill, particularly as I think that it's going to be a real mess when it actually gets rolled out in the real world. I don't know about you. But my TV doesn't hook up to anything. We don't have cable. We don't have satellite. We don't have any of that stuff. I live in a neighborhood that's a pretty mixed neighborhood. 
And I can guarantee you that when we go through this conversion, I'm going to hear about this at the post box at the end of my dirt road. Because government can do a whole lot of things, but you, you mess up people's televisions, and they're going to get really upset. And I am very concerned that this rollout and the information that's being given to consumers is inadequate. Uh, and that there are going to be a lot of people who come home on the day after this conversion takes place, and they're wondering what the heck happened to their television. Because the information has been inadequate, and you're putting the burden on consumers who bought a device that worked, a television, and then saying, oh, well, you know, you have to buy a new one. It's not an expense that families in my neighborhood want to pay right now with the price of gas through the roof and concern about jobs and housing and everything else. So I think it's about time that we got our act together. And I think it's about time that this committee started acting like a real committee of a real Congress, because today we abdicated that responsibility. I yield. The uh, gentlelady's time has expired. Um, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for having this hearing and Ranking Member Stearns for this important oversight hearing on digital television transition. I do believe that this committee is doing the right thing by focusing in on this issue. And I'd like to thank uh, our chairman of the overall Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Dingell, for his strong uh, support for the issues affecting uh, communities that will be affected by the digital uh, transition along the border. Uh, we have an enor enormous responsibility here, and quite frankly, uh, one of the reasons why I introduced H.R. 5335 was to help provide a fix for many uh, hundreds, hundreds of uh, thousands of individuals who will be affected if we don't do something immediately as well. Uh, the legislation that I've introduced would create a process at the FCC for broadcasters within 50 miles of the border to apply to keep running an analog signal for a minimum of five years after the transition. The Senate version of the bill, you may know, authored by Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson, passed the full Senate unanimously in August. It does have bipartisan support. I want to urge my colleagues on this committee to support the legislation because I do think it is crucial and to the success of the DTV transition in the border region. And while I represent a community in Southern California, I know what it means to live in those mixed communities where predominant uh, language is not English. Uh, we have to keep in mind what those viewers there are also uh, being able to obtain in those border communities, many which have uh, many economic, uh, particularly right now with the hurricane that just left uh, Galveston in Texas, the kind of information that they need at hand readily available whenever there are problems that prop up. Uh, hurricanes are one, earthquakes are other, but other disasters where people will be cut off from their main source of communication. This bill is important uh, for many of the border communities, and I'm happy to report that members of the Hispanic Caucus have gone on record in full support of this legislation, as well as several of our national Hispanic organizations. And Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit those letters uh, for the record uh, as well, if I could ask unanimous consent uh, to have that uh, provided for us. <coughs> General Lady's uh, time has expired, and the Chair recognizes the Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 without objection, the unanimous consent request of the gentlelady from California uh, is agreed to. Uh, we now turn and recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this very timely hearing. I, I appreciate your efforts to um, bring us up to date, and I appreciate our witnesses being here to talk to us about the state of affairs with DTV. Uh, particularly in light of the test that was done recently in Wilmington. I also want to thank our leader, um, uh, the chairman of the full committee, for recognizing early on that this uh, switchover presents an enormous challenge to our country that we can handle, but we need to make sure we do it in the most effective way. This is also Hispanic Heritage Month, and in light of that, I look forward to uh, hearing uh, within this setting 
about how we can better ensure that our vulnerable border populations are not left behind. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to just highlight the areas of most concern to me and my district. Uh, first, uh, as my district, my congressional district is 42 percent Latino, I am concerned by the latest GAO report which states that households in predominantly Latino areas are less likely to redeem their coupons. It's my hope that broadcasters, retailers, and everyone refocus their education efforts to reflect this reality and to do something about it. Second, the results from Wil Wilmington fall short of where we should be in terms of consumer understanding of converter bo boxes and lost signals. Once again, it's good to have this test to see what the challenges are and that we have a few weeks left uh, in, in which to, uh, to redouble our efforts. Um, this needs to happen to educate consumers about how to use converter boxes and whether other equipment like antennas might be necessary. Lastly, the GAO reports that NTIA has no specific plans to address the expected spike in demand for coupons as the transition date nears. I think we should all expect that that's going to happen. I want to hear from NTIA how it would handle such a spike and what administrative costs it might be associated with that. So again, thank you, Chairman Markey, to our witnesses. I look forward to hearing from you how we can use the remaining time before the switchover to ensure that this transition goes as smoothly as it should. And I yield back. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for being late. Uh, I want to thank uh, you for calling this follow-up hearing, and I know we've had a number of hearings on it, and uh, I have a district in Houston, and so uh, we have a lot of problems going on, and I want to thank you for getting and holding this digital television transition. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the test in Wilmington, the first city to switch to digital, and other issues that need to be addressed between now and next February. We have little time to address these issues beginning of the next Congress, and this will be the last thorough discussion we'll have until next January, about one month out from the analog cutoff. Most importantly today, as my hometown of Houston struggles to stabilize the situation, beginning and rebuilding, I like there is discussion of emergency communication after the digital transition. I'd like to thank our local broadcasters for their work, local coverage, to keep their viewers informed. I want to thank particularly DirecTV, carried KHOU, Channel 11, uh, Houston CBS affiliate nationwide on their satellite service so displays the fact you used to get the local coverage. What I'm still concerned about, an issue I raised at the last DTV hearing and whether there was battery operated digital televisions and converter boxes available or even in production. When I raised the issue last time, both the FCC and the NTIA acknowledged it was a problem. They're looking at how to resolve it. I hope to hear that progress has been made. The electricity outage at dark in the upper Texas Gulf Coast at the height of Hurricane Ike is the largest power outage in the state's history, according to the Public Utility Commission. Nearly 2 million, million people are still without power in Houston at above 90 percent average in my own district. If we, had, we don't have power now at my house or either our offices, if I didn't have my battery-operated TV, I wouldn't have been able to get the news. I would have had them here on radio. And after February 17th, we will not have those battery operators' TVs that are all analog. So it's not only something we need to consider, it's an emergency. And I would hope the FCC and the NTIA and the industry, if you're here, uh, retailers and the manufacturers, that is something that's needed. And if it takes a federal mandate, we'll work on it. The test market in Wilmington was almost postponed out of concern of Hurricane Hannah was going to hit North Carolina just as full power stations in Wilmington market prepared to sh shut off their analog signals and complete the transition. Tropical Storm Edward, Tropical Storm Fay, Hurricane Gustav, Hurricane Hannah, and Hurricane Ike all made landfall during 2008 hurricane season. The West has earthquakes and forest fires, and Midwest has tornadoes. The Gulf and East Coast have hurricanes. Whatever disaster, we need to make certain um, information is available over the television and people are able to view the information, whether it's power running in their home or not. And again, like I said, over 90 percent of my households in a blue collar, poor area of Houston in East Harris County do not have uh, power. Now, we also have the petrochemical complex, and so we're trying to get it back up operating. Uh, but without power, you can't, you can't keep up with the information through your television. And again, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today and for the broad discussion of topics. I hope we can look at the need for emergency communication prior to and during and after a national disaster and how these communications affect our digital transition. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Green. And uh, 
uh, all of our prayers and um, thoughts are with uh, you, your family, all of the citizens of Houston, Galveston. I know you have family in Galveston and the entire affected area. It's just a, a complete tragedy down there and, again, makes this hearing uh, so much more important that you were able to come here today and to remind us of the Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the um, chair recognized the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was coming to attend a DTV hearing and I heard an energy debate broke out, so I rant. No, not really. But it does highlight the frustration on this side of regular order and the fact that here we have a major energy bill to the floor. We are the Energy and Commerce Committee, the most powerful committee in the House of Representatives, having a major debate on energy, and it doesn't go through the subcommittee, doesn't come through the full committee. And when we passed the 2005 energy bill, it went through five committees. We know because we spent till 4 o'clock in the morning marking it up just in this committee alone. And of course, um, because of the time of year it is and the closeness to the proximity of elections, this thing gets thrown on the floor. And that's if there are people who are frustrated and, and uh, disappointed. Um, I think everybody can understand why, and hopefully in the next cycle when we get to a new Congress, we'll get back to regular order. I think that's all the point being. We do more harm to this institution when we don't use regular order and we don't do regular process because then we have people here to talk about DTV and a fight on energy breaks out. And, and, and we are better than that. And this committee, as you know, and my colleagues on the other side know, this committee is much, much better than that. Um, to the uh, to to the DTV, I just tell you, I was pleased with the the uh, test. I took the August break to go to my constituents to talk about coupons, to talk about uh, the digital receivers, to help people learn to hook them up. I got uh, constituents in really rural areas that I know the direct satellite folks aren't going to want to hear this, but they have decided to disconnect the direct satellite to just receive the great signal over free over the air digital TV. More channels uh, and that is what we would hope through a great transition and also the other benefits of uh, the first line responders and using new technologies. So I'm, I want to thank the uh, folks and I want to thank Chairman Martin because we did have a phone call and a discussion of the Wilmington issue that was helpful. Um, and I'm uh, pretty excited. I think I would just encourage members to really get proactive. Just like on the Medicare D debate, whether you're for it or against it, if you lean forward in the foxhole and you really took uh, the offensive action to help educate your constituents, I think the problems that will occur, and there will be problems, but if you take preemptive action, you can limit that. And uh, that's the best thing for all our constituents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Right, gentlemen's time has expired. All time for opening statements by the members of the subcommittee has expired. We'll now turn to our uh, panel. And we'll begin with uh, Kevin Martin, who is the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, a post he has held since 2005. The Federal Communications Commission is responsible for DTV consumer education. And he is here today to talk about Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, and its DTV test market. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you and good morning, Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Stearns and all the members of the committee. And thank you for inviting me to be here today and to continue to uh, update you on the status of the digital transition. With the national transition about five months away, much remains to be done. At the same time, since I last appeared before you, we have continued to make progress educating viewers and helping them to prepare for the upcoming transition. In particular, in addition to our ongoing consumer education outreach efforts, we have gained real-world experience with the challenges facing viewers and broadcasters as we approach the February 2009. Last week on September 8th, Wilmington, North Carolina became the first market in the country to transition from analog to digital television. Before I go into the details of the Wilmington transition, I would like to start by crediting Commissioner Copps at the FCC for challenging me and the industry to find a community that would be willing to help the rest of the country lead this transition. Commissioner Copps deserves the credit for urging the Commission to engage in a real-world test that would help the, ready the broadcasters, viewers, and the, the, all of us at the Commission for this upcoming transition. 
For its part, the Commission worked hard to educate, inform, and prepare those in Wilmington for the, for the transition. But it was our partnership, particularly those at the grassroots level, that was critical in enabling us to contact at-risk groups that we are focused on reaching, senior citizens, non-English speakers, and minorities, people with disabilities, low-income consumers, and those living in rural or tribal areas. The Wilmington switchover was critically important because it enabled us to learn what was effective in informing and preparing viewers and broadcasters for the transition. And it helped us identify what outreach and technical challenges still need to be addressed in the months ahead. While we hope that the transition in Wilmington went relatively smoothly, the measure of success in Wilmington is not what occurred last week. The measure of success in Wilmington is what happens next February and whether we are able to learn from this experience and apply those lessons as we move this effort across the country. Now, based on our current information, it appears that the majority of Wilmington viewers were aware of and prepared for the transition. Importantly, the consumer education campaign that was conducted appears to have been effective. Consumer calls received by the Commission at its call center indicated that the majority of the 400,000 television viewers in the Wilmington area were aware of the transition and prepared for it. During the first day of the transition, the Commission uh, helpline received uh, almost 800 calls, representing less than one half of one percent of the area homes. Notably, the volume of calls we received decreased by almost 50 percent in the two days after the switchover and continues to decrease with each passing day. In total, we have received about 1,800 calls regarding the Wilmington test, representing about one percent of the Wilmington households. For the entire first week, only 91 callers said they were unaware of the transition, and 163 callers were aware but did not take any action to prepare for it. Several challenges, however, do also remain. Though our consumer education efforts appear to have been effective, our focus now turns to resolving the technical challenges, and some of these challenges are easily resolved and others are not. With respect to the callers who are experiencing difficulty, I have directed our engineers and our outreach staff to work directly with those viewers and assist them in resolving their individual questions and needs. For example, as of last Friday, there were 329 calls to our helpline about converter boxes. Thanks to the dedicated Commission staff, many of these difficulties have been easily resolved. And specifically, the Commission staff were able to resolve uh, 262 or almost 80 percent of those calls as they came in. The solutions were also of, often relatively simple. Consumers just needed to either rescan for channels on their television set or their converter box or properly hook up the converter box. On a going forward basis, consumer education efforts are going to need to instruct consumers about how to effectively hook up their box and the need to rescan. Unfortunately, some viewers are experiencing problems that will not be as easy to resolve. For example, there are a number of consumers in the Wilmington area that have lost access to the Wilmington NBC affiliate. Prior to the digital switch, the Wilmington NBC's affiliate signal was available to viewers outside that television market as far south as Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and as far north as Raleigh, North Carolina. The Wilmington NBC's affiliates news coverage, uh, new coverage area, however, no longer includes these out-of-market communities. Some of, these, some of these viewers will be able to watch their local NBC affiliate in Myrtle Beach and in Raleigh. There are some, however, who will not have access to any NBC affiliate. Our goal is to ensure that all viewers in the Wilmington area and the country have access to the same television signals they did prior to the television transition. The Commission is currently exploring what steps can be taken to address this problem in Wilmington and to minimize this burden on viewers as we move throughout the rest of the country. Finally, relatively few consumers lost their broadcast channel as a result of the digital cliff effect. I have previously testified that our engineers estimate that about 5 percent of over the -year viewers may need a new antenna to receive digital television signals due to the digital cliff effect. Only about 15 percent of viewers around the country receive their signals over the year, so we estimate that this will impact less than 1 percent of all viewers and that they would need a new antenna. The data from Wilmington suggest a similar outcome. Of the 960 calls that we received about reception and technical problems, as I said, 553 related to the NBC affiliate. The reception problems for Channel 6 were caused by a significant reduction in the service contour, not by the digital cliff effect. If we assume that all of the remaining calls were caused by the cliff effect, this still represents less than approximately 0.25 percent of all viewers in the Wilmington area. Moreover, many of the calls that we received we were able to resolve with relatively uh, simple technical advice, uh, about 136 of them. In short, for the stations whose DTV coverage was designed to replicate their analog coverage, complaints about the cliff effect were well below our estimate of the 1 percent. The early switch to Wilmington has been instrumental in helping the Commission identify and understand and hopefully prevent some future, uh, some future problems with the rest of the nation uh, as we move to the transition in February of next year. But the measure of success in Wilmington is not what happened on September 8th, September 15th, or October 15th. Rather, it is how we are going to take those lessons that we learned and apply that knowledge throughout the rest of the country. 
I uh, uh, would ask the, re the rest of my statement be entered in the record, and I uh, would look forward objection, to answering your questions. Without objection, it will be included in the record in its entirety. Uh, we now turn to Ms. Meredith Atwell Baker. Uh, she is the Acting Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. She therefore has primary responsibility for the DTV Converter Box Coupon Program. Ms. Baker first joined NTIA as a senior advisor in January 2004 and was named Deputy Assistant Secretary in February of 2007. We welcome you, Ms. Baker. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Stearns and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. Educating Americans about the options for the digital transition has been and administering an efficient and consumer-friendly coupon program have been the top priority for NTIA over the past two years. With 154 days to go until the DTV switch occurs, we have made significant progress. Since the program's launch on January 1st and through September 10th, 2008, the volume of coupon applications has been strong. Nearly 27 million coupons have been requested from 14 million households. This is equivalent to more than 105,000 average household requests for each of the 260 days the program has been operational. Over the last 30 days, average household requests are up to 111,000 per day. The rate of coupon redemptions has likewise been strong. Over 10 million coupons have been redeemed through September 10th, a rate of 49 percent of for all coupons and 55.4 percent for coupons used by over-the-air only households. The cooperation of converter box manufacturers and retailers has greatly contributed to our consumer-friendly program, and we appreciate their partnership. As of September 10th, we have certified 156 converter boxes, including 82 boxes with analog pass-through and at least one wine guard that works with a battery pack. The program also now includes more than 23,000 participating retailers with over 29,000 outlets in all 50 states and territories, along with 35 online and 13 telephone retailers. This list does include two notable recent additions, Amazon.com and Office Depot. To develop and implement outreach for the increased coupon participation by over-the-air households, NTIA correlated current participation rates with the best available industry data. We estimate that about 70 percent of the over-the-air households that are potential purchasers of converter boxes have requested coupons as of September 1st. In other words, the coupon program participation by over-the-air households is on track in 187 of the nation's 210 television markets. NTIA is working hard to implement specific outreach plans in the 23 markets where participation rates in the coupon program are lower than expected. This is a tool and it will continue to evolve and we will continue to share this with the members of this committee. We believe our consumer education efforts are working. Based on the Wilmington test pilot held on September 8th, we learned that strong and steady demand for coupons and boxes can stem a rush in the final days leading up to the transition. We also learned that it is important for consumers to act early so that they have ample time to address any technical issues that might arise in installing the converter box. NTIA has now adopted messaging to apply, buy, and try converter boxes. Consumers should apply early, buy a converter box, and try the box to ensure that it works, troubleshooting for any issue that they may experience well in advance of February 17th. The success of the Wilmington pilot shows that when governments, industry, and nonprofit groups coordinate closely, the whole truly does become greater than the sum of its parts. Last Friday, 24 federal agencies convened at the White House to discuss activities across the executive branch agencies to enhance consumer education and assistance to our target populations. It was very encouraging to see how USDA, the VA, HHS, and the IRS, among others, are helping millions of the vulnerable Americans prepare for the digital transition. We continue to explore how these good practices can be applied to other federal agencies to reach a broader cross-section of Americans who rely on over-the-air television. I'd like to now turn briefly to how NTIA is responding to a couple of key challenges that we have faced administering the coupon program. First, 
The final rule for the nursing homes and P.O. Box program changes is at the Federal Registrar and is awaiting publication. We have, are pleased to be taking this step to make the coupon program more inclusive. In the same vein, the Department of Commerce submitted draft legislation to Congress last week to be able to maximize the number of coupons NTIA could distribute while not exceeding the $1.5 billion in total funds authorized for the program. The legislation provides NTIA with statutory flexibility, if needed, to utilize funds from other programs and to spend up to $7 million to cover administrative expenses of the coupon program associated with the high demand. Any additional sums for such purposes would be authorized upon approval of OMB and a 15-day notice to the House Energy and Commerce Committee and Senate Commerce Committee. Assuming that consumer requests for coupons will increase as the February 17th transition date near, nears, as we all do, NTIA wants to be as prepared as it possibly can be to maximize consumer participation in the coupon program. Without the flexibility to increase administrative spending, if needed, NTIA will be able to distribute 44.5 million coupons. We believe that the draft legislation is a responsible and prudent approach to address potential additional demand for coupons, and I urge its immediate consideration. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, Jen, you, thank you so much. Your time has expired. Our final witness, Mr. Mark Goldstein, is the Director of Physical Infrastructure for the Government Accountability Office. He has also been a frequent visitor to this committee regarding the DTV transition. And today he will discuss GAO's latest report on the DTV converter box coupon program. Welcome back, Mr. Goldstein. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the GAO report that we're issuing on NTIA's implementation of the mandated converter box subsidy program. The Federal Government and the private sector have taken many steps to prepare for the DTV transition. NTIA created and implemented a digital to analog converter box subsidy program. Additionally, the government, television, broadcast industry, cable and satellite providers and other carriers of broadcast signals have established several educational efforts informing consumers about DTV and the subsidy program. However, the success of the DTV transition and the subsidy program requires consumers' understanding about the transition and the steps needed to continue receiving a television signal. In addition, consumers will rely on retailers to provide information as well as to supply eligible converter boxes for the program. In my testimony to today, I discuss what consumer education efforts have been undertaken by private and federal stakeholders and how effective NTIA has been in implementing the converter box subsidy program and to what extent consumers are participating in the program. First, private sector and federal stakeholders have undertaken various consumer education efforts to raise awareness about the transition. For example, the National Association of Broadcasters and National Cable and Telecommunications Association have committed over $1.4 billion to educate consumers about the transition. This funding has supported the development of public service announcements, education programs for web broadcast, websites, and other activities. In addition, most national retailers participating in the converter box program have developed consumer education campaigns to raise awareness of the transition and the program. Federal stakeholders, the FCC and NTAA, have developed consumer education plans that target those populations most likely to be affected by the transition. In particular, they have focused their outreach efforts on certain demographic groups, including seniors, low-income, minority and non-English speaking in rural households, and persons with disabilities. Second, NTIA is effectively implementing the converter box subsidy program, but plans to address a likely increase in coupon demand as the transition nears remain unclear. As of August 31st, 2008, NTIA had issued approximately 24 million coupons, and as of that date, approximately 13 percent of U.S. households had requested coupons. As found in our recent survey, up to 35 percent of U.S. households could be affected by the transition because they have at least one television not connected to a subscription service, such as satellite or cable. In U.S. households relying solely on over-the-air broadcasts, approximately 15 percent, of those who intend to purchase a converter box, 100 percent of survey respondents told us they were likely to request a coupon. Therefore, a spike in demand for converter box coupons is likely as the transition date nears. According to NTIA, an increase in requests around the transition date may cause a delay in issuing coupons. However, we found that NTIA has no specific plans to address an increase in demand and that it hasn't encountered challenges in issuing coupons within its requirement of 10 to 15 days from the date the coupon application was approved. Given the challenges to meet this requirement, 
and its lack of a clear plan to address a potential spike in demand, consumers might incur significant wait time to receive their coupons and might lose television service if their wait time lasts beyond February 17, 2009. In terms of participation in the Converter Box Subsidy Program, we analyze coupon data in areas of the country comprised of predominantly minority and senior populations and found that participation varies. For example, we found that zip codes with high concentrations of Latino or Hispanic households had noticeably higher coupon request rates, 28 percent, when compared to areas with predominantly non-Latino or non-Hispanic households, about 12 percent. We also found households in both predominantly black in Hispanic or Latino areas were less likely compared to households outside these areas to redeem their coupons once they received them. Additionally, we analyzed participation in the converter box subsidy program in the 45 areas of the country on which NTIA and FCC focus their consumer education efforts, and we found coupon requests to be roughly the same for zip codes within the 45 targeted areas as compared with areas that were not targeted. NTI estimates that it will see a large increase in the number of coupon requests in the first quarter of 2009, and our analysis confirms that. And as the transition nears, a spike in coupons is likely. However, NTIA has not developed a plan for managing that potential spike or sustained increase in coupon demand. The time required for processing coupons has improved since consumers incurred significant wait times to receive their coupons at the beginning of the program. But until recently, NTIA fell short of its requirements for processing coupons within 10 to 15 days. Given the relatively low participation rates to date and the amount of time it took to process the spike in coupon requests early in the program, NTA's ability to handle volatility in the program uh, it remains uncertain and consequently consumers do face the potential risks that they may not receive their coupons before the transition might lose their television service. That's why we've uh, mentioned in our report we've recommended that NTA take actions to improve a plan that they might be able to put in place. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks. I would be happy to respond to any questions <coughs> your members have. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Goldstein, very much. The Chair recognizes himself for a round of questions. Chairman Martin, given the problems that many Wilmington consumers had at home in hooking up their converter boxes, would you support more so-called soft tests in which they replace programming on their analog signal with information on the transition? Oh, uh, sure. I think that trying to implement soft tests throughout the, uh, throughout the country is a good idea. When, um, recently, I announced that the Commission was going to undertake an effort to try to target uh, our resources on educating consumers in those at-risk markets, some 81 markets in which you have a high percentage of over-the-air population. And one of the things we're trying to do is coordinate with the broadcasters to encourage them to have a soft test uh, during, during our visits to those markets. For every broadcaster to have that kind of a test? Yeah, we're trying to actually encourage them to, absolutely. They, I think that's very important. Uh, but one of the things that we did learn in Wilmington, and the broadcasters actually uh, have already come back and informed us, that the soft tests need to last for a significant amount of time. They first ran the soft test for uh, 30 seconds in a minute, and they discovered that that wasn't getting any kind of consumer response. Uh, consumers weren't able to go turn on the other televisions in their home to see if it was actually connected. And they uh, came back and ran one for five minutes the week before, uh, and that was the only one that actually received a significant number of consumers calling in. And one of their recommendations to us has been to get all the broadcasters to run soft tests for at least five minutes. Well, let's, let's, let's have all the broadcasters do that then in the near future so that uh, they can each learn from that experience. Uh, would you support at least one station in each market continuing an analog feed after the shutoff, again with such information on the screen? Oh, with the uh, with the with the scroll like we've done in down in Wilmington. I mean, I, I listen. I think that that would be helpful uh, from uh, the consumer standpoint. But I think that we are limited by the law that requires broadcasters to uh, turn off their analog signals uh, on you know on February 17th. But I think it would be helpful for us to find a way to allow for the broadcasters to inform um, to inform viewers uh, for some certain a short amount of time afterwards. Um, how do we get more consumers to hook up? and try their converter boxes prior to February 17th so that we don't have chaos on that day for the um, helplines with everyone waiting until the end. Well, I, I think one of the um, both challenges and the, the lessons learned from Wilmington was the problems people had just in turning on their con their converter boxes and making sure they were scanning for <coughs> channels. So we need to incorporate into our education materials across the country the fact that, you, that they do need to go on and hook it up and try to scan and look for those channels early on so that we'll be able to make sure that they're prepared. Uh, those the, pro the, the good news is those problems are rel were relatively easily solved, uh, by just but, but they are going to need to be incorporated into the education materials going forward. So I want to commend you for your call for 
retailers to stock more $40 analog pass-through boxes, ensuring that low-income consumers can take their $40 coupon and get an inexpensive box is vital for certain households to make this transition successful. Uh, I hope that the retailers respond favorably uh, because they will be uh, basically on the hot seat. Uh, if people are going into these stores across the country and those boxes are not available. Do you know how many stations nationally, Mr. Chairman, will shrink their coverage area when they switch? Well, the, um, the, the question is how many of them are going to significantly shrink the, their coverage area, like what occurred in uh, the one channel in Wilmington. Uh, I've had, the engineers are going back through and they're trying to estimate it. They estimate that somewhere in the neighborhood of around 15 percent of the markets may have a station that will shrink in some significant way. What, I've had, what we're needing to do is go back and analyze how we can go in and fill in those coverage areas through one of several different mechanisms, but basically putting some other kind of antenna out there to make sure coverage is still going to those people that don't have any kind of a signal. How long will it take for us to complete that process? Well, the, um, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've told our engineering staff that uh, this is a, the highest priority and the, really the number one lesson learned from the Wilmington experience because we need to make sure that we're working and coordinating with those broadcasters to address this problem. So I think it's going to take us a few weeks to identify what all those markets are and what we can actually do on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, it's very important for that to be completed very soon right. so that uh, those stations uh, can correctly communicate and we can, with the uh, their consumers that they won't be receiving that signal anymore and that that will be something that uh, <clears throat> can be compensated for in some fashion, uh, either by that station or by something coming out of another market. Right. Assistant Secretary Baker, the GAO today states that uh, NTIA has no specific plans to address the expected surge in demand for coupons. Uh, often it takes up to 15 days or more for consumers to receive coupons once they order them. With an increase in demand over the end of year holidays and as we near February, we need a specific plan to get this surge of applications processed and consumers out the door quickly so that consumers don't wait a significant amount of time. Will you give us uh, uh, a, uh, a plan in writing within 30 days, NTIA's plan for dealing with the surge in applications? Uh, yes, sir, but our, our plan is the legislative package that we have submitted to you this week. I think that that is an accounting for what we see as an important um, uptick in requests in the coming months. Um, we would like to see that uptick in November and December like it was in Wilmington, a nice steady bell curve where it decreases in <coughs> January and February. So we continue our consumer education to to. So your plan is more out. money. Is there anything else in addition to more money? Well, um, we've we've looked at several different things, included downloadable uh, downloadable uh, coupons. Also, we've looked at a rebate program. Put, if you could put it all in a plan for us, get it to us in 30 days. And I understand you want more money, but we want to see your whole plan. You know, we want to see the concept, and then we want to see the execution. Okay, so happy to do so. Okay, its uh, concept is 20 percent, execution is 80 percent. So we would like to see what your plan is for the execution of this because that ultimately is the test. And Chairman Dingell and I wrote to you yesterday about additional funding. You have requested for administrative expenses to implement the coupon program. Could we also get uh, a timely response to that uh, as well because time is short? Absolutely. Could you respond to us in 48 hours on that? Uh, we can. Uh, I hope that I can get it cleared in 48 hours. I'll do my very best. Well, they should be drafting the answers right now. We're adjourning uh, for the year next Friday, so uh, time is of the essence. Yes, sir. Um, please try to respond as quickly as possible. Chair, uh, time has expired. I recognize the uh, ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Stearns. Uh, just a question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you want it in 48 hours and we're not, we're going to be here all next week. Is it possible if she runs into a very difficult situation she might have a forbearance here? Uh, we, 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 can't, we can't forbear on legislating uh, the solutions. So well, they, if she, gets us, the, the, uh, if she gets us bill. the information by the end of the week, we'll be in a position to be able to evaluate it to make a determination as to what right. form of any legislation that is being considered would take. Okay, I'm just we're hearing complaints today about the legislative process, so we're just trying to make sure that we don't uh, okay. hear the same complaint from your side. Well, I saw how quickly you folks turned around an energy bill, and so I was just wondering here. Um, Chairman Martin, let me ask you a question. Um, after the transition in Wilmington occurred, 
I was told you got about 797 calls the first day. Is that approximately correct? That's right. Yeah. And the second day you got maybe 200 calls? Uh, no, it was a little more than that. It was uh, about half. It half. decreased by about 50 percent every day. Okay. Yes. After five days, what was the total number of calls? The, on the fifth, uh, Just the, total. Uh, the total of calls was 1,800 calls. 1,800 calls. So that would roughly be maybe first day was a half, half of 1 percent, so it might be less than 1 percent. In total, it's about, yeah, it's, it's around 1 percent of the total households. In okay. So eventually 99.9 percent .9 people were happy and they didn't call. 1 percent called. Now, if you extrapolate that for a national, that's still very successful, it seems to me. Now, I admit, if you're one of those 1 percent that did not get your channel and you're upset, uh, you obviously have to get some satisfaction. Um, do you think you could make a confident statement that this roughly 1 percent they were, were questioning, you'll be able to bring that down significantly by February 17th, 2009? Well, we're certainly trying to think, uh, we're trying to work through everything we can to try to bring that, continue to bring that 1 percent down. I mean, as you said, 99 percent is a, a very high number, but on the other hand, the 1 percent when you extrapolate around the country is a lot of people, and we're trying to how we focus on how we can continue to bring that, that down. Um, so what we've, and I think that there are some things that we can end up doing. Uh, the, one of the simple things is trying to educate people about how the converter boxes uh, actually work a significant number of the calls were people just not understanding how to actually connect it to the television and or to have scan. But most likely you'll bring it down to maybe a half a percent instead of one percent. Well, certainly the... the uh, you're going to move in. If, if this is the first transition, you're going to make all these new steps. You've got the uh, rest of September, October, November, December, January. I mean, you have uh, five and a half months to decide and do this. It's certainly... Well, I mean, certainly I think the American people and the people, my colleagues should realize this has been a pretty dramatic success. And you should be proud of it. And I think. Uh, well, I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. And the NTIA should be proud too. And, and the, the chairman talks about chaos. I don't know if chaos, when you have something that's 99.9 percent .9 working, is chaos. No, so sure. I just want to clarify that. Well, no, I appreciate it, and I certainly uh, do uh, appreciate that, and thank really the folks in Wilmington for their efforts and, and the community down there and helping make sure that the word got out. So, if Had you thought about another demonstration, maybe uh, in November after the election? It, it might be another chance for you to kick it up a notch. We, we've, uh, we have, and we would like to. We haven't been able to find another market that will volunteer, uh, but if we can find another market that will volunteer. We I, I, I volunteered <laughs> Jacksonville, but Jacksonville didn't seem to, to, Jacksonville, Florida didn't seem to volunteer back. So. No, no, they, uh, we, we, did, uh, we did contact them. And and, uh, and several other markets, and we still are looking for another volunteer. Have you contacted find. Gainesville, Florida, where the University of Florida is? Um, the uh, we, you know we've contacted uh, uh, the Florida Association of Broadcasters after our last oh, hearing, yeah. and we did talk to them and had them contact all the markets to see if any were willing to. And no one's, yeah. Um, Assistant Secretary Baker, um, you're asking for an additional seven million dollars because of uh, the statutory cap uh, on administrative funds. Let me ask you, how make how, how but don't you expect to, to give back some of the $1.5 billion that we've given to you. Can you explain to us and remind us how much you're giving back? Well, as of now, with the 50 percent redemption rates, we estimate that we will return $330 million back to the U.S. Treasury. So $330 million back to the U.S. Treasury you're going to give us. So that means that you'll use roughly $1,170 million uh, million, uh, 1.170 billion. So that's that's a pretty impressive figure that you're going to give back 330 billion dollars. Considering at one time Congress wanted five billion dollars to do this program, and a lot of us argue on this side we didn't need five, we didn't need four, we didn't need three, we didn't need two, we didn't need one. We could get it by with 900 million, and you're almost at that figure. Now, is it possible that you might not need this seven million? How confident do you think you can lead this? Well, there's just no certainty on uh, to this. So from our best data estimates, we, we think that we might need it. So we think it's prudent to ask for it since this is our last chance. Uh -huh. And there's no funds are not fungible that you can't. It's just because we have administratively, legislatively said you can't do it. It's not fungible that you could take $7 million out of the $330 million that you're refunding to us. You couldn't use that. 
We have a statutory administrative cap at 160. Um, we have the funds and the coupon money. We've also submitted several other programs that were under the Digital Television and Public Safety Act where we could come up with the money. Um, so there's several places that we could come up with the money. It's, at this point, we're looking for $7 million. We'd like flexibility for a couple million more if our estimates are not correct. Um, but certainly we can get the money in a couple different pools. Uh, just the last question, Mr. Chairman. Is it possible you'll give back more than $330 million in refund to the uh, taxpayers? Uh, depending on redemption rates, sure, and demand. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for eight minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I guess I need a little clarification. You weren't here for some of the earlier remarks by the uh, members on the other side of the aisle, <clears throat> which dwelled on uh, the energy bill that's coming up. So I guess I need some sort of clarification. Uh, the title today is Status of the DTB Transition, 154 Days and Counting. I'm wondering what the D stands for. Is that digital or drilling? I'm not real sure. The other thing is I'm from the state of Texas, and to be quite honest with you, we believe that every broadcast tower out there, if it doesn't double as an oil rig, it's a waste of space. <laughs> but I'm also cognizant that maybe my narrow view of the energy needs of this country and how we meet them isn't the comprehensive approach that we really need which is what we'll have on the floor, and hopefully my colleagues will have an open mind and proceed accordingly. We'll get back to the subject matter. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Martin, thank you for your service. Uh, I know there's, there's been uh, many, many a challenge, and this is going to be one of them. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and I think the next panel probably will give us a feel for what's going on on the ground. As members of Congress, we go back home, we get a sense of it. In your own individual capacities, I'm not real sure that you're there in those communities, but I think we're going to have those representatives. So I'm going to kind of stick to kind of general policy considerations. What hinders and, and what benefits? What encourages and what discourages? And uh, it was brought to my attention some time ago, and we're trying to address it because I think it does have an impact, and that is the 5 percent tariff uh, or import tax that is being levied by customs on these particular converter boxes. And in your opinion, um, again, does that lower cost or does it increase cost to the consumer? Would any, uh, any kind of a tax uh, of a assessment is going to increase the overall cost of it and, uh, for, for the ultimate consumer? Does it encourage or discourage adequate supply of the converter boxes? Well, I mean, I, I'm uh, always hasn't had any kind of a tax or a fee assessment on any kind of a consumer product. I mean, that will always end at an effect of increasing the cost to the consumer and therefore probably decreasing the, the number of the demand that they would have and ultimately the supply. Well, and I appreciate that. Of course, you know, since I agree with you, I think it's a brilliant answer. Uh, I want to talk about the quiet period. That that's, can be very controversial. We have something going on even in, in my city right now between a broadcaster and the cable provider this quiet period. And I know that we have, depending on what side of the argument you might be on, and also even what's coming out of the FCC, as to what would be, if we have this quiet period, what would be this time period? Uh, does it make more sense to have the quiet period closer to the transition date of February 17, 2009, and shortly thereafter, rather than way, way before and expiring before the operational date? Oh, sure. I think it's critical that it occurs right around, uh, right around the uh, February 17th transition date, uh, you know, for some uh, period of time shortly before and for some period of time shortly thereafter so that there's no confusion uh, from the consumer perspective that if they lost any kind of a signal, it, it wasn't because of the transition but rather uh, because of any negotiations that were going on. So I think it, it has to be centered around the, tra the transition date. And I think we'll have testimony about why people believe a certain period before or after or maybe not even after might be best, but I, I, I tend to agree with your analysis. If we're really addressing uh, the problem of what's causing or constituting the confusion and we, we don't, that's the end game here. It's not really to give advantage to any particular stakeholder. Uh, Secretary Baker, on reissuance, the numbers are, are fairly extreme, are they not, uh, for those that have actually applied and received their coupons but have not redeemed them? Uh, I would say that it's our top complaint is that the coupons have an expiration date and that, you know, coupons are, are lost or, or um, 
um, stolen or they have not been received in the mail. Yeah. I mean, and I have also received uh, some other, uh, uh, you know, I think, answers. Simply people get them, hold them, then they decide, get cable or buy a new TV. I mean, that could be part of it, too. I'm afraid that may not be the majority of those unredeemed coupons. I know that I've had town hall meetings where people show up with two of the coupons and they just say, we didn't redeem them. What can I do? I don't have a really good answer, but I don't believe that you're going to provide me with an answer. Well, the answer that I give to you is the one that we give to folks, is that we made these coupons transferable. And I'm sympathetic with the problem, but what we need here is a groundswell of effort of fans, family and friends and civic organizations to help people make the transition. Um, yes, their coupon has been redeemed, but I could give them my two coupons. And so that does seem to provide some solace to the, the fact that these coupons have, have expired. All right, and that may be one approach. It's kind of a practical way if we can pull this off, if we get the right people connected with the right people. But as far as anything that you may be coming up in the way of policy or requesting rule changing, your testimony or your written testimony indicates timelines don't allow it. Is that correct? I, I, I think, first of all, the statute, the statute itself it does not allow it, so I think that it would take a statutory fix. I think then we would have to have a rule change, which has proven to be quite um, you know, even on an expedited basis for the nursing homes and P.O. boxes has taken a, a good period of time. Um, I think from a policy standpoint, I worry about the waste, fraud, and abuse of opening it up for reissuance. Um, but, but most importantly, I guess from where I sit, is I think it would throw whatever economic analysis we have about what coupons we have and need, I, I think it would throw it out the window. So I, I think there's fairness, there's waste, fraud, and abuse, there's timeliness. But most important, I think then we would just really have no idea how many people whose coupons had expired would come back and ask for more coupons. And I know this is the sixth hearing, and I want to commend the chairman for being so vigilant. And I know that we're going to have some additional hearings before that February date, and we'll just keep our hands on that pulse. Mr. Goldstein, uh, and I don't want to misinterpret what my colleague, Mr. Stearns, may have indicated about the success at this point. It's way too early to gauge whether how successful we are. Is, isn't that an accurate statement? I mean, as we get closer to it, we have high uh, rates of uh, individuals not redeeming coupons. We have individuals that may be getting those converter boxes, not hooking them up until the last minute. Then we find out, as in Wilmington or maybe, uh, I know that in my town, the, the question of individuals just having difficulty hooking up the converter boxes and who do we get to assist. Um, when will the jury be in? I think the jury won't be in for some time in some period after February 17th. I, I would mention a couple things real quickly. I think we've had a lot of success in reaching out. I think the private sector and FCC and NTAA should be commended for the work they've done in reaching out to the public. I think they've done a, a, a quite good job, but it's an extremely difficult task, and there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, some of the issues that have been raised in Wilmington quite candidly, are things that we raised in our reports over the last year, including coverage area gaps, antenna issues, hookup issues that would be, we said a long time ago, these things would be, would likely be problems. And sure, they are, they are surfacing now. We've seen them in Wilmington. The other thing I would add is we are concerned particularly about expiration uh, rates that we've, uh, that we've seen so far. In the work that we did uh, for this report, we found that um, Seniors, particularly, there the expiration rates in areas where there were 50 percent or more seniors uh, in, in any particular zip code in the United States, that that rate was 43.2 percent, where for the U.S. population it was 30.5 percent. And so there are some, uh, uh, for, and, and other groups as well, for uh, Latino and black groups uh, as well. There are um, many of the minority populations appear to still be at some disadvantage, and um, we have a long way to go. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes Mr. Shimkus for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I said in my opening statement, the, um, I, I did take August break to really try to, to work this issue. And uh, Secretary Baker, I want to especially thank you for uh, Brian Danza in the uh, Chicago area who came down once or twice for us as we went around the congressional district. Um, and. I've gotten great response from the, the constituents. And I do want to encourage, again, my colleagues to, to really be assertive 
as much as the broadcasters are working hard and the cable industry and and uh, the FCC and you, uh, we, we could also, through our office, through our websites, through our newsletters, through all the above, could be, to be very proactive. The, um, uh, Chairman Morton, the calls uh, that you received on the Wilmington, uh, from Wilmington residents, how many were you able, to, your staff able to handle over the phone? Uh, we were able to handle uh, almost 80 percent of the calls related to anything on the converter box, and we actually think we'll be able to handle even more of them, but 80 percent just on the phone initially. Uh, significantly less on the antenna, about 136 of the, you know, 600 or so calls on the antenna side we were able to handle, but so it was a so smaller percentage on that. And as we talked uh, in our conversation, I think last week, a lot of that was just uh, encouraging the consumer to press the... That's right. A press the channel scan a button. Significant, a, a significant problem from the converter box program was just that the consumer actually had to push this to restart it and have it scanned for channels. I'm guilty of that. And that too. was, uh, <laughs> and that was a. Although it's in the, it's on the box, to do that. I mean, if you just, and I, and I, even in my discussion with constituents, it's really easy. You get your, you get your box. You take the antenna. You plug it in. You take the uh, digital receiver. Plug it in the TV. But you got to press the, the scan the channels thing. So. Uh, Probably a lot of those that you're able, um, you can resolve that. Exactly, exactly. That was easily, it was, that was the single biggest thing that we were able to resolve for consumers just when they called up and said that my box isn't working, I've got it hooked up. First, just checking the connections to make sure it was hooked up, you know, uh, walking them through that and then just asking them to scan it. Now, going back to Secretary Baker, two of my uh, town hall meetings are, one was at a senior, both of them were at senior centers. One was in Olney, Illinois, the home of the white squirrels. And, uh, Galconda. This is in the far. We do have white squirrels in in southern Illinois, and the um, it's in the southeastern part, really rural Illinois. Uh, at both times, not at my prompting, but with the seniors at both events, there were seniors there who had already done this on their own, and they were offering their excitement to the other residents about the digital transition. Uh, I, what, what can you report on consumer satisfaction that you've heard back? Well, we haven't had a single complaint on the box. Um, and so I, I've now that we ha have Wimbledon, Wilmington, now that we have Wilmington, we know that there are some problems with the scanning. We know that some um, people did not put batteries in the remote control, that they didn't realize the television had to stay on one channel. But as far as the box itself goes, we have not had any complaints, and people are really thrilled with the picture that they're receiving from the box. How about any rate of returns of the receivers to the retailers? Um, from what I know, which is only from the retailers, which we stay in contact with, you know, all the time. Um, this is one of the lowest returned consumer electronics products that they've ever had, that they've seen very little return. Well, and going back to these two uh, small rural areas, as I, as I mentioned, you know, you, you do the application either by phone or the web, you get the letter, it has the one or two cards, it gives you the retail locations, but also what was emphasized by one of these ladies is just phone order and mail order of these receivers. Can you talk about uh, phone and internet re retailers in instead of this traditional brick and mortar because in rural America, especially with gas prices so high, they may not want to drive 50, 60, 70 miles to go to the retailer. I, I think you've hit a great issue that we need to, to press is that um, we have 35 online retailers, including Amazon.com now, and we have 13 phone retailers. I think what we're dealing with here is a population that, that gets in their car and they go to their favorite store, maybe Walmart, and if Walmart may be out of boxes, then they go back home and they get back in their car the next day and they go to the same Walmart. We need to encourage people to think a little bit outside the box. We have 30,000 retail outlets, as well as, uh, obviously, the online and telephones. You know, Radio, Sh Radio Shack Direct to you will mail the box to you for free. Um, Best Buy, Circuit City, they all have phone operations that should be easy for this population who are not as technical to actually get the box. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always nice to see you in the chair. You too. Uh, I have three questions, and uh, I'm going to put the questions out. They're all to uh, Chairman Martin, and um, I'll start with the first one. Um, I understand you know how many um, uh, people uh, call the FCC's helpline uh, with uh, questions about their converter boxes. Um, do you know how many people called 
a TV station with a question? There were uh, how engaged? I guess it's yeah, a measurement of engagement. The um, uh, Elon University, a university in North Carolina, had volunteered some of their students to answer calls. At the last estimate that I had, they had several hundred calls. It was uh, less than 300 calls, but I think 260 some odd calls. Not too many. Not too many. Um, on this issue of um, of a quiet period, I, I want to go back to this. Yeah. I know. Uh, um, Congressman Gonzalez uh, mentioned it, and I did in my opening statement. Um, I think it's important to know when this quiet period um, actually takes place, um, uh, because um, uh, by all means we want to uh, uh, protect Chairman Markey's um, uh, Patriots or Mr. Barton's uh, Dallas Cowboys. Now the NAB uh, has in its letter to you of uh, August 11th, proposed, um, uh, I think, February 4th until March 4th, a full two weeks prior to and after the transition date. Um, there's a big thing that happens in January. It's the NFL playoffs. Can you imagine if this thing is dropped during the NFL playoffs? I mean, there'll be a revolution in the country. So I, I think that we have to uh, look at this with a very practical, pragmatic eye. So uh, can you tell us what you're, um, what you're planning to do with a quiet period? I had, uh, there's an order. When it would begin, when it would end? There's an order in front of the commissioners that deals with some of, uh, some of the other minor issues surrounding the GTV transition, uh, some more technical issues. But I had proposed to the other commissioners that we consider implementing and having some kind of a requirement of a quiet period. I had had one that was slightly longer than the one that had been proposed by the NAB. It was approximately three weeks before the transition is what I had proposed. Um, so I it, would, it, would it cover the playoffs? You know, um, uh, I, I don't. Think, you know what? Let me just put it this way. I think you have to keep that in mind. The, All right? Uh, 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 be on notice, and maybe no one thought of it, but it is a big deal in the life of our country. So I think that we should start sooner and, um, and stretch it out a little later. And um, uh, as soon as you make a decision on that, can you get back to us on it? And I think that you can uh, make that decision pretty quickly. My third question is, um, I'm sure, Mr. Chairman, that you've seen the um, uh, the Reuters Cisco report, which ranked uh, our country, the United States of America, 16th in the world in broadband quality. Now, uh, I guess the good news is is that we made it just ahead of Russia. But um, listen to who we're behind or who's ahead of us: Slovenia, Latvia, Lithuania, Japan, Denmark, and Korea. This is not uh, a source of pride to us in our country. America really should be number one. We should. We know how. Um, so uh, my question to you is, uh, no surprise, uh, the AWS3 um, auction, um, uh, I believe, I think you believe, is an extraordinary opportunity for our country uh, to dramatically um, uh, uh, shift access to the Internet. Uh, can you tell us when you think you're going to bring this up for a vote at the uh, at the commission? Sure, I, um, I, I do. I do agree with you on the importance of it and the importance of trying to utilize it to help uh, 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 bridge the broadband gap. Uh, that we have uh, in the country. So I have, uh, I have encouraged it. I had put it up for a vote once already before the commissioners. They wanted some more time. They asked me to go and do some testing. additional testing. Right. Mm -hmm. we've, uh, we've now completed that testing. Just last week, our engineers submitted the results of that testing into the record. We'll allow some people to comment on that, those results. Um, but I do anticipate being able to bring that back up in, in front of the other commissioners. I will need the support of the other commissioners, but I uh, will then need to bring that back up. But I do need to wait for the testing results to be filed in the record and allow for um, people to file any comments they wanted on that. Good. Okay. I think that my time is just about expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you to all of the witnesses. Chair thanks the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, one I appreciate, and I, I guess because of what's going on now, uh, I do want to talk about both our Assistant Secretary and our Chair about <clears throat> the problem with the battery-operated no. converter boxes uh, okay. at our last Oh, it was, uh, but we know now it's much more imperative. And uh, um, without these, like I said earlier, I couldn't have had TV at my own house. And even as of yesterday, when I left to come back, um, how are our agencies uh, 
planning to address that, and since we brought it up at an earlier meeting, hopefully there's been some discussion. Well, we, we did, um, uh, we, that was one of the important issues that, uh, that came up both early, at the early hearings and also in Wilmington. It was one of the issues that was identified very early on by the broadcasters in Wilmington, the concern they had with it. Um, uh, again, I think the importance of the test highlighted the issue and actually allowed for us to make some progress on it. The broadcasters there worked very closely with one of the manufacturers, Weingarten, uh, who makes converter boxes. They've developed a battery-operated pack that can attach to their converter box. It was for sale down in Wilmington before the transition. Uh, I, we've, we've seen it. We actually, the Commission has uh, uh, purchased a, both the, one of the converter boxes and the pack so that we can take that around and show people that this is, you, there is a battery-operated one to attach to battery-operated TVs, and it is a Available now. Okay. And it'll, uh, to the rabbit ears, typically, that uh, you can battery operate television because that's the only thing we have. The, um, it will be. It, it will work within a, 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 a battery operated television uh, to provide signal the way the battery operated television does in the analog world today. Um, and it will have a battery operated pack. It's a twelve dollar pack you can attach to the to the converter box. Okay. So that would work, but then it's pretty well. Universal, any type of small battery operated television? It, um, no, no, it, uh, it doesn't work. It works with the, the converter, works with any op better battery operated television. It would work with any of them. The challenge would end up being, though, that it, the battery, op the pack doesn't attach to every, uh, every converter box. There's only one converter box manufacturer that has developed that kind of a battery operated pack. We're continuing to try to work with other manufacturers to see if they'll develop a similar uh, packet, but, uh, but that's the only one that we have today. Okay. Oh, I'd appreciate, you know, any update because we still have two months left of this hurricane season. And, uh, but if we don't do it now, then next year uh, we'll really be in a problem. The, uh, the digital cliff where the picture disappears on digital televisions rather than coming in snowy as it did on analog sets seems to be a problem that wasn't expected. Do you know of any smaller battery operated televisions would be more, uh, that would be more susceptible to this? Does this, the severe weather affect that in our case? Um, the, you know, uh, uh, weather can uh, weather can affect any kind of a, a signal. It can, but um, uh, so I mean that can always have some kind of an impact um, when, when there is severe weather. That can always have an impact in the reception of over-the-air signals. Okay. And would it take rulemaking or congressional action to allow consumers to use their coupons to purchase these battery-powered devices for emergency use if they happen to have when they get two coupons? Instead of you know, in buying one converter box, would that be? Would it also be available? The um, the coupons can currently be used for the converter box. The oh. um, the battery operated pack is twelve dollars. You have to attach to it, and the coupons can't be used for those for the back uh, the pack. So under the NTIA rules, it can only be used for the converter box itself. Okay, and and I apologize for being in and out. Uh, one last question, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate. The, uh, our problem is, I think it was brought up in lots of the opening statements in our district that. People got their coupons or their little credit cards, and and they didn't pay attention to the expiration date. And I know we had a disabled uh, constituent that we actually sent a letter from our own office. And what is the practice at uh, NTIA on dealing with something like that? Uh, well, unfortunately, we are not reissuing coupons. Um, we have interpreted the statute to tell us that we cannot reissue with coupons, as well as we think that there's a waste, fraud, and abuse issue, mm -hmm. there's a fairness issue. But we are doing exactly what you just said, and we're encouraging um, families and friends, neighbors, civic groups to help people make the transition, since the coupons are transferable for someone whose ex coupon has expired to get the mm -hmm. coupon from someone else. Okay. So if someone has an expired coupon, they can't apply for another one then? That's correct. Okay. So, and, and I have to admit, um, someone told one of my uh, constituents, well, just have somebody apply for one and then they can give it to you. So, uh, and I, I questioned whether, you know, I don't know the falsification of anything saying if I, if I applied for something for my son or my daughter or even a neighbor and I gave it to them, is that's not calling into question uh, someone not using it for their own personal use? We've made them transferable to make sure that people could help other people in the transition. And if you had applied for one and you'd used one, then you could apply for another. If you'd applied for two and they'd both expired, then you could not apply for another. But, yeah. but we want to make this transition easy, so easier for people. So we think if, if you can help your mother tran make the transition, that's why we made the coupons transferable. Well, yeah. frankly, the best way to make it easier would be to let them reissue the converter, uh, the coupons, instead of having a friend or a family member do it. But, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time. So. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Solis.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for coming and speaking to us this, this morning. And I wanted to direct my first question to Assistant Secretary Baker and ask you uh, a little more in depth about the outreach to the Latino community at large, and especially along the U.S. border. Uh, the Transition Assistant Act, uh, which was recently signed in, into law, according to your testimony, there's approximately $4.5 million that will be available for consumer education. Um, I'd like to ask you how the NTIA plans to use this funding and what proportion will be used to educate those Latino or Spanish-speaking uh, re uh, recipients or households in, along the U.S.-Mexican border, but also in other uh, parts of, of the U.S. And I wanted to know more about how much money was going to be spent for that outreach effort. You mentioned, uh, I believe in your testimony, that there's a grassroots bid that's underlined of money or monies that will be available for community-based organization. How are you selecting those and what will be their effort and how much money is actually being allocated for that? Well, in an effort to expedite this, this education process, um, we are not doing a complete rulemaking. What we're doing is taking unsolicited bids, of which we have several before us currently. Um, we are looking at, at the underserved communities, the minorities, as well as actually um, having transition help, having people go into houses and help them hook up converter boxes. So those are kind of our priorities as we see it. Will you have some of those individuals that will be able to speak uh, Spanish or other languages as necessary uh, if absolutely. they call in That's and one of our vulnerable that. communities that is valuable for us to provide extra assistance to. When is this going to roll out? Uh, we're hoping the 1st of October, the first of the grants will go out. And how many uh, of those groups will be focusing in on the Spanish-speaking population? Well, it does depend on what the proposals that we receive have. Um, and I think at this point that the... Uh, so there's really no correlation between the need or you're just looking at whoever bids? Uh, well, we need proposals in front of us to be able to expedite. So instead of running a full rulemaking as to how we'd get the grants out, which would be after the transition, what we're doing is taking proposals. Well, um, one concern have I have is that you might uh, give bids out to people who really don't understand or really are geographically more inclined to understand the demographics of particular areas or regions. So that's something that I would draw your attention to. Obviously, Californians, Texans, Puerto Ricans, and what have you are a little bit different, and, and uh, I don't know, one size always fits all, so you might, might keep that in mind. I'm also concerned uh, regarding some of the information that's come back to us about how uh, the converter box is actually, the coupon, the coupon for the converter box is actually being utilized, and my question is with respect to what's happening in Puerto Rico. I've gotten a lot of complaints from people there that they've received the coupon but did not have the availability to go down and purchase at the local retail store. So you obviously have a problem here, um, and I, I would like to hear your response. Sure. I think, uh, um, first of all, we'll absolutely take in, into account, as far as the LPTV $4.5 million grants, the Hispanic considerations, as we do in our target markets. Um, as far as Puerto Rico goes, it's, it's a very unique community. Um, I think it has the highest over-the-air population at 39 percent. Um, and we have now um, received coupon applications for, or, or from 50 percent of the households there. I think that we heard that there was a shortage of converter boxes there. We've worked hard with the retailers to make, make sure that that has been, uh, those, those shortages have Apparently, no from a document I have here, a letter we sent to you, there was actually a request for 600,000 coupons, but there were only 50,000 boxes that were available on the island. How do, you, how do you bridge that gap? We're talking about a big problem here. Well, we've seen now strong redemption rates in Puerto Rico, so we feel that those... Uh, those Are you working with the retailers? We've been working with the retailers. Because I mean, we've gotten complaints uh, as of late that we still have a big issue here. But not only that, it's also the implementation. I think the chairman, uh, Mr. Markey, said that earlier. Eighty percent of our focus should be on how we actually get the box in the household, and people need that instruction. They probably need someone beyond just giving them the coupon, actually calling them back. Did you, did you acquire the, the converter box? Have you plugged it in? Do you know where to get help? And having that information available in, in Spanish or whatever language it's going to take. And it could even, I mean, we're also talking about uh, senior citizens and rural communities who may not be as, as literate. I, I think you're right, and I think that our consumer education focus clearly needs to, to um, turn to implementation. 
that's why we changed our messages to apply by and, and try to make sure that the try part, that the converter boxes work, that people can get this assistance that they need. And we certainly realize that minority outreach in so, several different languages is important. Um, I'm, st I'm still uh, a big concern. I heard some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle say that um, they were very happy to hear that monies were, would be returned because they wouldn't be utilized because everything was going so efficiently. Um, I would beg to differ with that and still uh, would like to get more information about how uh, demographic groups are going to be um, addressed, whether they're disabled, seniors, rural, and obviously uh, that are uh, monolingual. The gentle lady's time has expired. Uh, Chair now recognizes himself. Uh, I want to say at the outset that I think the test run in Wilmington was a great idea, and, and I want to thank Chairman Martin and Administrator Baker for uh, you and your staff's work in getting it together. Uh, I think it gives us all a much better picture of some of the challenges that uh, we're going to face in, in February. And one of the things I thought was really smart was that the branding was, was simple. Uh, I heard that they called it the big switch uh, in Delaware, and I, I think you know, we need to think about that nationwide, something that's uh, uh, a simple message uh, and, and easy to convey to people. Uh, and I don't think we should rush into any definitive conclusions considering the amount of, of, of attention that's been paid to Wilmington. I think uh, Commissioner Adelstein said that, you know, when you send out so many staff to a city and give it all this extra consideration that, you, you know, the observer effect starts to come into play. So uh, I, I don't think we should rush to judgment on it. But I do have a couple questions about it. Uh, Administrative Baker, I, I saw in your testimony on the last page of the very last line that, that you estimate only 60 percent of over-the-air consumers require a converter box. But in Wilmington, we saw the participation rate uh, at 203 percent, which is, is sort of double the, the estimate that, that we got. And what's your, what's your explanation for, for a 203 percent participation rate? Well, uh, I think that Wilmington was a com compressed period of time. We announced in May that we were going to switch in September. I think if you're get, you know, for our switch on February 17th, people are going to make different decisions. They're going to go through the holiday period. They might make other choices as to whether they're going to purchase a converter box with a coupon or not. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, when we look at the numbers that we project from Wilmington, uh, we still find the same bucket needs to be filled. You know, it was quicker in Wilmington, but the, the numbers are still kind of the same when we estimate our, I've got two, several different estimates of data, but when we separately make our estimates of the current requests, and then we bump it up for what we think is going to happen in November, December, and January, we come to the same number if you extrapolate the numbers from Wilmington. So. Um, I, I do think it's a valid test, although I do think it was a compressed period of time. Mm -hmm. um, our, our but aren't you concerned that, you know, if your estimate sort of cuts the number in half and the actual data doubles your estimate uh, and you start to apply that nationwide, it sounds like that, that we're sort of overestimating the number of people who won't need boxes, at least if, if Wilmington's any indication of that. I mean, do you think people are hoarding boxes? Um, I, I don't find that we have not heard of such a thing, no. Um, we've found very little of uh, that. We, we've not heard of any of that, actually. I mean, you can't, you can't reapply once your coupon expires, and you're going to have a bunch of people out there with coupons that, you know, if they're hoarding them, they'd be the only market for, for coupons. Sounds like a pretty good uh, industry being developed uh, for people selling their coupons that, that uh, they don't need. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing any evidence of that going on uh, well, as, as an explanation for why you've got such a high participation rate? Um, I guess a couple of different things is the boxes are good now, so we're hoping that people hook them up and use them now because digital programming exists now. Um, that while the coupons can be transferred and we encourage people to help their family and friends to transfer them, they can't be sold. Um, we've had terrific experience with eBay and, and Craigslist. We've seen, we've seen coupons appear and they get pulled immediately. So um, we really, at this point, have had very little of um, that type of incident. Chairman Martin, I read accounts that the, the biggest problem uh, wasn't that people weren't aware that, that the switch was coming. It, it, you know, the biggest problem seemed to be that they didn't have a clue about how to get these converter boxes installed. They, I guess they thought they'd set them on top of their TV sets and by osmosis or something, that they, <laughs> they connect themselves. And, and I see we're going to open up a new eligibility uh, application for firefighters grants now where uh, in addition to, you know, training and equipment, uh, you know, putting converter boxes together is going to be a way to get a firefighter grant. Uh, I mean, in Wilmington, basically, we, 
we asked the, the help of the fire, firefighters to help people connect their boxes. Did, did we pay them for that? Was there a did they we do did. that for free, or did we, you? No, no, we did. Them? We did had we had um, uh, uh, very small contracts with um, several grassroots organizations to be able to go into uh, people's homes who were disabled and or uh, were shut-ins and otherwise able to get out and hook up the converter boxes for them and a special number people could call. Um, the last estimates we heard as, as of last Monday, uh, there have only been about 35 people, but as of um, as of today, there's been about 250 people uh, that they, the local fire departments and local public safety officials have gone. So is it? Is it the Commission's intention to contract with fire departments across the country come February to install people's converter boxes? I mean, and do you have the money to do that? And, and, and uh, you know, what, what's the game plan for, uh, you know, it seems that, that one of the big missing pieces of this puzzle that we're learning from Wilmington is we need a lot more education for folks or our way to get assistance out to seniors and disabled and other folks that need help putting the converter boxes on. Well, first, uh, absolutely. One of the one of the lessons is we want to make sure as many people as possible understand how the converter boxes work and how they hook them up and how to scan. But we actually are trying to, uh, we put out uh, a bid for other grassroots organizations to be able to come forward and do the same thing that we did in um, in Wilmington. We put out a bid that was for, for grassroots groups to come forward and say they could do the same thing for shut-ins and other people that are disabled that can't get out and hook up their boxes, that we would try to do that at least in those 81 markets that we're trying to target throughout the country. So we actually are trying to do that. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired, and uh, the Chairman now yields to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the subcommittee for holding uh, yet another hearing on uh, this important issue. Um, I welcome the panel, and uh, I'm going to use my few minutes just to make a couple of comments that won't surprise Chairman Martin at all. Number one, uh, I, this transition matters. It matters to a lot of people, especially the folks you, you, Mr. Chairman, were just discussing with uh, Chairman Martin. But the reason for this transition, to remind us all, is to make available analog spectrum for critical emergency communications, which leads me to the D-Block auction. And I know, Mr. Chairman, that you're having a meeting on the 25th, or I think that is still the case, which is next week, of your commission to see about auction rules. Uh, I want to urge you to get along with this and move along with this, and to make sure that uh, there is full public participation in the rulemaking. I think it is critical that we do this, and we do it right, and we do it quickly. This is a, a, a set of comments you've heard me deliver many times. Secondly, I, uh, I think I spoke to you, and I also have tried to follow up about the possibility of a regional hearing in Southern California. It's not the only place that there should be such a hearing, but I know there have been hearings in, in, in various uh, parts of the East Coast. The reason I want to suggest that is, uh, is one, there is a, uh, a, an emergency communications uh, group out there that is keenly interested uh, in this issue. Uh, L.A. County is the largest uh, and most diverse county in America and uh, I think is, is proceeding on one path, but maybe after a, such a hearing could could think about some other directions. That's one point. But my second point is, with respect to the DTV transition, there is a very large minority community out there. I represent many cities, and I know Ms. Solis does too, uh, which are majority Latino, and uh, where, is, so far as I can tell, some real progress is being made. So we might actually be able to uh, tell a, a success story, uh, for example, with respect to markets that at least uh, Univision reaches. They claim they have a very good uh, plan for this. So I, I, uh, I want to repeat my invitation, give you a chance to respond in public to my invitation, uh, if, you, if you care to, and to urge you again uh, uh, about uh, moving uh, quickly and uh, with full participation on, on a set of auction rules that will uh, be successful this time. And I just would invite your comments. Sure. Well, first, uh, thank you uh, for your support and for supporting the Commission going forward as, as uh, quickly as possible. It does have to be an open process, but it is time for us to go on and put out a further notice because we still need to go through that public process before we can move to a final order. Uh, at this stage, even on an expedited basis, you're talking about an order not being able to get out till around the end of the year, which would still uh, mean an auction couldn't even occur until sometime you know, after about six months. So this is really critical for us to move forward, and I appreciate uh, uh, that support, and I think it is time for the Commission to. And, uh, 
And uh, we, we actually uh, am happy to and would like to end up going out to Southern California to end up participating in a hearing. We've been working with your staff on some dates uh, that would make sense from, uh, from, uh, from, you all, from your perspective. One of the original time frames you and I talked about on the phone was this week, and with this hearing, that, that didn't work out as well. <laughs> but, uh, but we are actually looking for other dates that we can come out there. Well, I appreciate that. I, I would just point out uh, the obvious, which is that even on your timetable, the auction will not be completed before the transition is completed. Uh, I, uh, uh, I would not only note major natural disasters, which have been occurring with regularity along the southern coast of America, but my continued fear that there may be some uh, unnatural um, man-made terrorist attacks that uh, uh, could still come our way, and we don't have a day to waste uh, before putting in place a robust national interoperability uh, capability for emergency uh, communications, and at least I don't understand how that happens uh, if we don't uh, have either one national or several appropriate regional auctions uh, and, and develop this public-private idea that we've been talking about for a long time, where the private sector uh, it, it lends its enormous uh, capability to build out for the public sector uh, a, a, uh, a capability way beyond push-to-talk radios. Uh, that it can grow into over time and that will give it uh, on U.S. battlefields the same capability or better that we have on foreign battlefields for our U.S. soldiers. America is a battlefield as well, uh, both against nature and against terrorist attacks. So I, uh, uh, I will continue to ask the same questions to all of you uh, until we get uh, uh, to the right place. And I've got three seconds, but if anyone has any additional comments, I'm sure the chairman would let you speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the general lady. Uh, there being no further questions from members, we, Chair, would like to thank this panel uh, for being here, and uh, we're going to get ready to seat the second panel. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to get started. We want to welcome our second panel. Uh, we're going to go right down in, in order. Our first speaker will be Mr. Tom Romeo. Uh, Mr. Romeo is currently Vice President of Federal Services for IBM, where he's responsible for managing IBM's business with numerous federal agency. Most importantly, he is responsible for managing IBM's contract with NTIA to run the converter box coupon program. Mr. Romeo, welcome. Uh, and Turn your microphone on and you have five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the continuing progress the IBM team is making implementing the NTIA TV converter box coupon program. Earlier, earlier this morning, you heard from NTIA Acting Assistant Secretary Baker about how interest in the TV converter box coupon program continues to grow. Consumer demand for coupon remains high, with over 26 million total coupons ordered as of September 10th, representing an average of more than 3 million coupons ordered on a monthly basis. The continued high rate of demand is exceeding expectations. Consumers requested the total initial base phase allotment of 22,250,000 coupons as of July 31, 2008. After hitting this milestone, the coupon program shifted to a two-track distribution mode. The program now ships both contingent phase coupons, which go only to over-the-air reliant households, as well as recycled initial base phase coupons. Because the redemption rate for coupons remains below 100 percent, funds continue to be available to recycle coupons from the initial base phase of the program. This allows households not solely relying on over-the-air broadcasting to continue to request and receive coupons. 
Between August 1st and September 10th, over 2 million recycled coupons were ordered. During the same time frame, over 2 million contingent pays coupons were ordered. The unique and fluid nature of the coupon program continues to require our team to react quickly to pinpoint needed adjustments and implement alternative solutions when necessary along the way. When Wilmington, North Carolina was designated as a test market for the DTV transition, we were able to expedite updates to the website, providing information specifically tailored to consumers in Wilmington. We refined consumer education targeted for the Wilmington market, resulting in over 70,000 coupons ordered by Wilmington residents. We continue to refine the interactive voice response, or IVR, system to make it easier and faster for callers to order their coupons over the phone. A new IVR script implemented in July increased by 15 percent the number of callers able to complete their coupon order within the IVR system. Overall, the IVR system is able to support, to support 60 to 65 percent of the callers without the need for a live agent, a very high IVR resolution rate by industry standards. We continue to adjust messaging on both the English and Spanish IVR system to expedite the coupon ordering process and provide a positive experience for the consumer. I'm pleased to report the voluntary participation of both large national retailers and smaller local retailers remains strong. As of August 29, 2008, more than 2,300 retailers representing more than 29,000 stores nationwide are currently certified and participating in the program. Eight of the largest consumer electronic retailers are among the retailers participating in the coupon program. Consumers are also able to order converter boxes from 35 online retailers or from any of the 13 re retailers offering a phone order option. Amazon.com became a participating online retailer earlier this month. The strong demand for coupons indicates the effectiveness of our consumer education strategy. We are on the right track, educating consumers about the coupon program and remain focused on intensifying and further refining consumer education as we head towards February 2009. Our partner, Ketchum Public Affairs, continues to lead the consumer education effort, focusing on communities most likely to rely more heavily on over-the-air broadcasting than the general population, and continuing to build and leverage a network of committed partners. The proportion of households ordering coupons who self-identify as over-the-air reliant has increased from 47 percent in January to 55 percent today. The consumer education campaign is increasing its reach to those consumers most at risk as we transition to digital broadcasting. We are now refining coupon program messaging to encourage consumers to act early in the process and order their coupons prior to December 31, 2008. Today, a consumer can expect to have their coupon order processed and mailed within 10 to 15 days and to receive their coupon within three to four weeks of placing their order. Ordering coupons prior to the end of 2008 will give consumers enough time to buy a converter box, install it, and troubleshoot any issues before February 17, 2009. The IBM team is pleased to be part of implementing this vital program and recognizes that many challenges remain on the way to February 17, 2009. Our team continues to be ready to meet those challenges and work to ensure that consumers across the United States have continued access to free television broadcasting, including educational, entertainment, emergency, and homeland security information. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The committee now welcomes uh, Christopher A. McLean, who is the executive director of the Consumer Electronics Retailers Coalition, a coalition of the nation's largest electronics real, real retailers. Mr. McLean has also served as the administrator of the Rural Utility Service. Uh, please summarize your testimony in five minutes and uh, begin now. Thank you very much. Thank you for, a pre for, for inviting the Consumer Electronics Retailers Coalition to appear today. Our members include Best Buy, Circuit City, Radio Shack, Amazon.com, Kmart, Sears, Target, and Walmart, as well as three major retail associations. As we gear up for the final DTV push, we can be very proud of how far we have come. Retailers have now accepted more than 10 million NTIA coupons with very few problems. I am pleased to report that every CERC member company is now a participant in the NTIA program, coupon program. 
CERC members have been working at the local level with community organizations, government leaders, and the media to take the initiative in DTV public education. Our members have transitioned their inventories to feature analog pass-through boxes, and the current supply seems to be plentiful. The Wilmington pilot has been very useful to all DTV stakeholders. We were gratified that Chairman Martin specifically thanked CERC and our members at the September 8th Wilmington ceremony. Our members participated in educational events, donated converter boxes to senior centers in conjunction with the CEA, and directed the earliest shipments of analog pass-through boxes to Wilmington. A few issues from the Wilmington pilot stand out for retailers. Even with extraordinary educational efforts, some shoppers waited until the last minute to purchase their con converter boxes. Also, apparently, many consumers also waited to hook up their DTV converter boxes. Some viewers also had more problems with antennas than had been anticipated. Our members are looking closely at the Wilmington experience to analyze and apply the lessons learned. As we approach the final days of this Congress, there is one more thing that can be done to improve the DTV transition for consumers. It is ironic that with one hand, our government is subsidizing the distribution of converter boxes to consumers, yet with the other, apparently inadvertently, is imposing a 5% tariff that makes the product more expensive. Representatives Ron Kind and Kevin Brady have introduced bipartisan legislation to correct this problem, and we respectfully ask members of this committee to support the timely passage of this bill. As we enter the home stretch of digital transition, some challenges remain. Retailers are working to keep up with broadcaster soft shutoffs. These on-air experiments are very useful to viewers. We are working with the NAB to share scheduling information with retailers to prepare for customer response. We are also preparing for early shutoffs. CERC is aware of a handful of communities where stations are planning to completely convert to digital and cease analog broadcast in advance of the February deadline. These situations, most notably in western Nebraska, where public television stations and a couple of commercial stations convert ahead of schedule, create many Wilmington experiences. Retailers are studying the Wilmington lessons, and we are working with NTIA and the FCC to understand not just what happens in advance and at the time of conversion, but what happens in the aftermath. Retailers are assisting the FCC and their 81-city DTV tour, and we are focused on Puerto Rico. Our understanding is that the supply and demand situation on the island is improving. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, nobody knows what the end game uh, will look like. However, there are two key dates with this in, that we keep in mind in this respect. First, of course, is the February 17, 2009 transition date. The Wilmington data suggests that some consumers will wait until the last minute to address their conversion needs. The more conversions that can be banked in advance of the switch, the better. Second is the date when the last coupon expires, perhaps well into 2009. As unprecedented as the coupon program is, the post-coupon market for converter boxes is completely uncharted territory. In conclusion, it has been our privilege to work with this subcommittee, as well as the NTIA and the FCC, to make the DTV transition a success. The chairman and the subcommittee has literally planted the first seeds of the DTV revolution many years ago. CERC and our individual members are committed to helping all Americans reap the rewards of a rich DTV harvest. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the interesting information about some communities uh, acting in advance. Seems to me that's a, uh, a wise idea. Our third witness is David K. Rear. President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Association of Broadcasters. Prior to joining the NAB, Mr. Rear served as President of the National Beer Wholesalers Association. Welcome, um, and please summarize your statement in five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Congresswoman Harmon, Congresswoman Solis, and Mr. Gonzalez. My name is David Rear, and I am President and CEO of the National Association of Broadcasters a trade association that represents over 8,300 free over-the-air radio and television stations and networks. I was in Wilmington, North Carolina with Chairman Martin, Commissioner Copps, and Secretary Baker on Monday, September 8th, when the four commercial and one religious station transitioned to all digital broadcasting. 
So what lessons did we learn and what are we doing to implement those lessons? One, in Wilming Wilmington, there was near universal awareness of the DTV transition. On the day after the switch, stations received preliminary data that showed out of the 226 telephone calls received, only one caller was unaware of the switch to digital. This is indicative of the nationwide numbers that show DTV transition awareness near universal levels. Despite these high numbers, however, broadcasters will continue to run DTV action spots to educate viewers. Additionally, the NAB is compiling polling information from the Wilmington experiment, which I will be happy to share with the committee. Two, we learned that many viewers needed help adjusting or moving their antennas or needed more detailed information about what kind of antenna they needed. Prior to Wilmington, NAB released two spots, Antenna Highway and Not Tech Minded, that raised this important issue. The announcer is the same person that we are used to help build awareness of the DTV transition, and our spots are all closed captioned and in both English and Spanish, and I'd like to show one now. You don't have to be technically minded to get ready for digital TV. Most Antenna TV viewers know we can upgrade our TVs with a low-cost digital converter box like this. But here's advice about the right antenna. Digital technology can now broadcast more channels for free, even free HD channels. Be sure you have the best VHF UHF antenna to ensure you get all the free channels out there. For help, visit antennaweb.org. Make sure your antenna TV is DTV with the right antenna. Three, we learned that some viewers experienced reception problems following the switch because they failed to scan for digital channels using their new converter box. As part of our national education campaign, NAB will create and distribute spots detailing how to use the scanning feature. Four, the call center in Wilmington was a key ingredient to their transition a centralized call center will be invaluable to the success of the nationwide digital switch. As you know, in just 154 days, the remainder of the country will make the historic switch. From running DTV action spots, to organizing speakers bureaus, to driving the DTV trekkers to communities across the country, NAB and its television networks, syndicators, and local TV stations are executing a $1 billion plus marketing plan to inform the country about the transition. Now, in addition to all that we've done, NAB has taken another step to further minimize the potential for consumer confusion. While we do not believe there will be any consumer confusion, in an abundance of caution, the NAB Television Board of Directors has voluntarily committed not to disrupt any relationship with our cable or satellite distributor partners beginning on February 4th, 2009 and running through March 4th 2009, a full two weeks prior to and after the DTV transition date of February 17th. History demonstrates that broadcasters and our distribution partners have a positive relationship and we have every incentive to continue to work together. At present, there are 1,017 stations, that's 81 percent of commercial stations, that support the NAB resolution. We have a broad range of stations endorsing this proposal, from NAB members like ABC, NBC, Hearst Argyle, and BLO, to non-NAB members like Sinclair Broadcasting. I expect that we will continue to add more stations and companies in the upcoming weeks. Through this DTV journey, I am most proud of the outreach we've done with diverse and varied groups around the country, including the Black Church Initiative, Esperanza USA, Native American tribal groups, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, state and local governments, AARP, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus, the 241 members of the DTV co coalition, and local television broadcasters across the country. Working together, we can meet the goal of ensuring that no one is left behind for lack of information. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, our fourth witness, uh, Kyle McSlero, is President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, NCTA, the CTA, the Trade Association, representing the nation's largest cable operators. Mr. McSlero also served as a Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy, and I'd like to welcome back our Chairman of the Subcommittee, Mr. Markey, who has chosen to stay down there in the corner. 
Uh, he's very modest and shy. And uh, Mr. McSlero, you're, you're now recognized to summarize your statement in five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee. I think I can safely say I'm glad to be here talking about the DTV and not energy. Um, <laughs> uh, you're many, the only one who feels that way, Mr. McSlero. <laughs> well, it's because I knew I was on the hot seat all those other times. Um, in many respects, um, I think the inter-industry cooperation uh, to educate consumers, to make available the information they need to know about the tools um, that they should be equipped with to manage the transition has gone very well. And I should say, uh, please continue. And I should say uh, that we are uh, very pleased. I want to compliment David Rear and, and other leaders in the industries um, for what they have done to, to ensure that cooperation has moved forward. But I do want to flag uh, what is a potentially a coming storm, which is called retransmission consent. And I know that on the first panel there was an exchange of views about this, but I think it's important to understand the context. Retransmission consent was added to uh, the legal landscape in 1992, at a time when the marketplace was very different. And by and large, over the last 15 years, um, most broadcasters, most cable and satellite operators have managed to work through that in a way that there's a rough equivalence of value being exchanged and consumers have been well served. But it is increasingly clear with a new election coming up in October 1st in terms of broadcasters electing to be must carry or pursuing retrans um, that with the economic pressures on the broadcasting side, with more and more equity or hedge funds investing in the broadcasting sector, looking for a quick buck as, as, as opposed to the long-term view, that there's going to be greater tension. And it's important to point out that retransmission consent is not a free market ne negotiation. Every broadcaster walks into a room knowing that at the very least they can insist on must-carry carriage or if they fill up to it, they can choose to pursue retransmission consent negotiations. So it's a classic heads I win, tails you lose proposition. When they enter the, the negotiations, they then know that every cable customer um, has to, by law, buy a package with all of the broadcast stations in it before they can buy any other cable network, including premium networks. And the networks know and the broadcasting station groups know that you can't, as a cable operator or a satellite operator, go out and negotiate for another signal with similar or identical program because network non-duplication and syndicated exclusivity rules prevent you from carrying an out-of-market signal that competes with what is essentially an exclusive product in a local market. So it's not a free market negotiation and, as I say, the overwhelming number of cases I'm confident will probably be worked out at the bargaining table. But it's clear that increasingly there's, there's tension and in, if you go by public statements uh, from some broadcasters, there's a desire to ratchet up dramatically in some cases, 500 percent the cost of those signals that would be carried by the consumers. Now this is relevant in the short term to the digital transition because most of the retrans agreements will expire around December 31st of this year. And so we have been having conversations with our friends in the broadcasting industry about a quiet period. But the problem is if, if you are putting consumers to the choice of either A, paying a higher bill, if the cable operator insists on protecting the interests of the consumer, then the threat is going to be that a broadcaster is going to pull the signal. And when are they going to do that? Well, they're going to do that in January precise period of time that NAB's voluntary quiet period doesn't cover. So you have this odd lapse of time where the food fights are undoubtedly going to break out where consumers have two choices, pay a higher bill or lose a signal. So I would urge this committee to make clear in unmistakable terms in the short term to broadcasters around the country that the digital transition is not business as usual. Cable operators, satellite operators are carrying um, uh, 
in the case of cable operators, we're carrying uh, must-carry stations in a dual format, which we didn't think we were required to do, but we voluntarily agreed to do that. It was incorporated into an FCC order. Everybody's leaning forward. This is not the time um, to confuse consumers about what's happening. And I should hasten to add that this isn't about leverage in the marketplace. I heard you, Mr. Gonzalez, before. I agree with your point. It should be short. Whatever the deal is, whenever it's struck, it should be retroactive back to the date of the expiration of the agreement. And then I think for the committee, there's a long-term challenge that we'd like to work with you on reforming retransmission consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would just note for the panel that there is a motion to adjourn on the House floor, and we will recess this uh, hearing uh, five minutes before the uh, conclusion of that vote. It is now 10 minutes before, so we have time to hear from another Witness, David Candelaria, who is Vice President and General Manager of Entrovision Communications, a Spanish language uh, media company. Entrovision operates one of the largest Spanish language radio networks, as well as the largest affiliate group of two Univision network channels. Uh, welcome, and please summarize your uh, uh, testimony. Thank you, and good morning. I've worked in the broadcasting industry for nearly 20 years and have spent nearly 40 years of my life living in El Paso, Texas. What I particularly want you to know is how important it is that the Congress pass the Border Fix Act legislation. Each and every member of Congress from the border region supports the legislation. While they may be Democrats, support of the legislation is bipartisan, and, have, and, and we have heard other, from other Republican members that they are behind the act as well. The reason I care so much about the bill is, as our Congressman Sylvester Reyes has said, that unless we do so, the tens of thousands of families and individuals in our region may be left behind. There is a fact of life in the Hispanic community along the border that you should be aware of. In El Paso, for example, approximately 45 percent of the Hispanic population is Spanish language dominant. That's 310,000 people, approximately. When Spanish speakers in El Paso and along the border need information, they turn to Spanish language television. Our television station, KINT, whose share of the evening news is six times that of the ABC affiliate, achieved that success by consistently providing quality news and vital information. Unless this Congress passes the Border Fix Act, our Spanish-speaking viewers will simply tune into Mexican television. As I have spoken about the act with various parties, a number of questions have been posed to me, and I would like to address them. First, I have been asked, that, is this not the best time to force viewers to transition since we have the educational efforts and converter box subsidy? While it is a good time, you need to be aware that there is a cultural resistance that, we're, that will prevent it from being completed at this time. Second, I've been asked why we don't seek to educate our Hispanic viewers to convert. In fact, our station has helped achieve in El Paso coupon orders and redemptions at 240 percent of, of the national rate, yet this is still not enough. Third, I've been asked why I should not expect our young people to press their parents to acquire digital sets in order to be able to watch the English language networks. The Nielsen numbers prove it. In El Paso, between my station, KINT, and the most popular station in the market, Mexico's XHJC, we take 30 percent of the viewing in prime time. The NBC affiliate, the NBC affiliate in contrast, takes just 4 percent in prime time, which I believe represents the English language pop population in the market. Fourth, I've been asked, why would four years help if I'm worried about getting Hispanic viewers to transition? The reason is simple. We just need more time to persuade Hispanics to transition and to acquire the digital uh, receivers. Fifth, I've been asked whether the, this sends the wrong message to other broadcasters who have invested in the transition. Now, we've all invested in the transition, and to continue, the analog signal is simply optional. Sixth, I've been asked whether uh, the legislation would prevent the recovery of the 700 megahertz spectrum so that it can be used by wireless and public safety purposes. The answer is, is a definite no. We have determined and the FCC has uh, confirmed to the Senate that there is no impact on, the, on any proposed 700 megahertz users should the Congress pass this legislation. Finally, I know that you will hear from English language broadcasters as to why the act is a mistake. However, these are the very same broadcasters who readily admit that Spanish dominant Hispanics do not watch their stations anyway. This testimony will be in the great tradition of the broadcast community that, is, that it has resulted in our poor reputation before the public sector. If there is a legislative or a regulatory pr proposal that would maintain or promote competition, broadcasters rush to stifle it with, with arguments claiming that the, the sky is falling. In fact, my English language competitors view the digital conversion as their opportunity to grab my business. 
Their view is that if Hispanics migrate to Mexican stations, the share of domestic English language stations will increase. This translates to money. All I can say is that the opinion of our congressmen and local leaders such as Barry Cortez and McAllen, State Representative Veronica Gonzalez of the Rio Grande Valley, who all support the legislation, should weigh more heavily on the scale of my self-interested uh, competitors. In summary, I urge you to consider that neither education, more coupons, more converter boxes, or visits from the FCC will convince the great number of Spanish-speaking population along the border to transition uh, when they have a clear alternative available. I am pleased that Hurricane Ike did not hit the border, but I worry that next year, if there is a hurricane that hits the Rio Grande Valley and then El Paso, how, how the word will get out if domestic Spanish-language television stations are not transmitted in, in analog, because we cannot rely on Mexican competitors. So as to protect the Spanish speakers along our border, I urge you to enact this legislation before this Congress recesses. I'm prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Candelaria. I would just point out that your last argument is also an argument for clearing the 700 megahertz spectrum so we can have true in national interoperable communications. The subcommittee will now stand in recess uh, for uh, the shortest possible time while members who are still here uh, go to vote. And uh, when we return, we will begin with uh, Mr. Kittleman uh, for five minutes and hope to conclude this panel uh, expeditiously and ask you all questions. Thank you very much. Subcommittee stands in recess. TV, the ABC affiliate serving the West Laco, Harlegan, and Brownsville and McAllen areas of South Texas. A welcome, and you have uh, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Marquis, Ms. Solis, members of the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and the Internet. Thank you for allowing me to testify today in opposition to H.R. 5435, the DTV Border Fix Act. My name is John Kittleman, General Manager of KRGV TV, the ABC affiliate serving the Westlaco, Harlingen, Brownsville, and McAllen area of Deep South Texas. America's transition to digital is a major undertaking for government broadcasters and the public. Thank you for your continuing commitment to make this transition as smooth as possible. A key component of a smooth transition, however, is coordination among the parties to ensure that public confusion is minimized. Congress recognized this when it changed the law governing the digital transition from one, one which would have permitted individual television markets across the country to transition at various times spread over the course of years, to the current law, which sets a single nationwide deadline of February 17, 2009 for the termination of analog broadcasts. Unfortunately, H.R. 5435 threatens to undermine the effectiveness of a unified national transition by permitting stations and border markets to delay the transition for as long as five years, creating tremendous public confusion. Now is not the time to delay the transition for our border markets. Converter box coupons are easily acquired on the phone and online. Converter boxes themselves are widely available in stores, over the phone, and online. Analog pass-through converter boxes are widely available and will allow border residents to benefit from the advanced U.S. digital services as well as to continue reception of analog signals from Mexico. An unprecedented national and local education effort is underway and will grow substantially as we draw closer to the transition date. As broadcasters serving along the U.S.-Mexico border, we understand fully the challenge before us. However, I would ask, imagine the challenge for border markets on our own to transition to digital in five years. No government subsidy program. National manufacturers and retailers unlikely to produce and sell converter boxes for the border residents who have not yet transitioned. No national education program. No unified local education effort as stations convert to digital piecemeal over five years. 
Attached to my written testimony is a letter written by 11 border market broadcasters from Brandsville to San Diego acknowledging these and similar concerns and opposing H.R. 5435. Also of concern is the impact on educational broadcasters such as our local PBS affiliate. I spoke with Mr. Pedro Briseño, General Manager of KMBH, last week. KMBH must vacate its analog frequency, channel 60, because the FCC has auctioned the spectrum for non-broadcast use. In addition, he indicated he cannot afford to continue to maintain analog and digital service and explained the difficulty of, ob of obtaining replacement analog parts as the country moves to the digital platform. Indeed, under the Border Fix Act, the date of a station's transition to digital will not be governed by a carefully choreographed public education campaign, but by the date that that station's analog equipment fails and is too expensive to repair. Despite its analog difficulties, KMBH is well positioned to embrace the digital future. Their station's digital lineup is as follows, PBS in English, PBS in Spanish, EWTN in English, EWTN in Spanish, from 38.1 to 38.4, respectively. Imagine the educational opportunities for our market that will be lost if our viewers wait five more years to transition to digital. Attached today is a letter from four border market PBS stations from Harlingen to San Diego stating opposition to 5435. This is all of the PBS stations along the border. Congress has asked broadcasters to convert their, digital, their stations to digital, and our stations along the U.S.-Mexico border have risen to that challenge. We have spent millions of, do of dollars to be digital ready on February 17. Many of us offer multiple digital channels, including local weather and targeted entertainment formats to better serve our communities. In today's difficult financial environment, should Congress now add the significant financial burden to border broadcasters alone of continuing analog broadcast operations for an additional five years or finding themselves at a competitive disadvantage against those that do? I would ask proponents of the bill what will change in five years to make this transition any easier. We will still face the challenges of serving Spanish-speaking residents, low-income residents, and the elderly. What will change is that we will not have a, a government converter box subsidy, manufacturer and retailer support, nor a nationwide education effort. Border broadcasters will be left on their own with the massive task of educating and equipping an unknown number of analog-only consumers. We ask Congress to help our border markets by assuring an abundant supply of coupons, of converter boxes, and education's efforts continue. Once again, thank you for your leadership in the transition to digital and for your consideration of these concerns. Thank you. Uh, our next witness is Mr. Andrew Setos. Mr. Setos is the president of engineering for Fox Group. He is a senior technology strategist for the company with oversight of engineering for all the Fox divisions. He's also a fellow of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. You have five minutes and thank you for coming. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, my name is Andrew Citas. I am President of Engineering of the Fox Group, and I thank you for inviting me to participate here today. As we approach the deadline for digital transition, Fox is incredibly excited about the many benefits that digital television will bring to the American public. We have been working diligently to prepare our network, our <coughs> own stations, and our affiliates for this important transition from analog to digital, and we are on schedule. From the beginning, Fox has been a leader in the digital TV build-out, in the creation and distribution of high-definition programming, and in the effort to educate consumers on how to prepare for the digital transition. To that end, Fox has aired more than 38,000 public service announcements on its owned stations. I would like to focus on one issue that is vital to the long-term success of local broadcast television, the broadcast flag. The flag is a descriptor that broadcasters may embed in a television program that signals that the program is not to be indiscriminately redistributed. Currently, there is no requirement that any television product respond to the broadcast flag. Local broadcasters are required by law to provide their content in the clear. This means that high-value content like the Super Bowl, the World Series, The Simpsons, and American Idol is not technologically protected against indiscriminate redistribution. Other platforms, such as cable, satellite, telephone companies, and internet distributors have already spent millions on the design, deployment, and maintenance of increasingly sophisticated technology for content protection. By contrast, local broadcasters are unable to offer any protection. This imbalance threatens the long-term viability of local broadcasting, which will lose high-value content to platforms that offer technological protections. The broadcast flag is the best way to prevent that, this serious threat to the future of free TV 
and we therefore strongly urge Congress to pass legislation that would authorize the FCC to adopt the broadcast flag rule. The digital revolution has created the opportunity for the theft of content on an unprecedented scale. The formerly burdensome and time-consuming process of uploading high-definition video content has become easy to accomplish. Millions of users of peer-to-peer -peer applications upload and download copies of broadcast television shows stripped of their commercials, thus putting local television at risk. Why? Because local t broadcast TV cannot exist without advertising revenue which is determined based on the size of the broadcast audience that is exposed to those advertisements. Fewer local broadcast viewers translate into less advertising revenue. If our revenues drop because of content theft, local broadcasters will no longer be able to compete with other distribution platforms for high-value content. This, in turn, means that people will no longer be able to watch their favorite shows or national sporting events from their local broadcasters for free. And without high-value content, local broadcasting will struggle to survive. The demise of local broadcast stations would be devastating for tens of millions of Americans for whom local broadcast stations are the sole source of news and entertainment. But even for people who have cable or satellite, local broadcast stations are the only source of televised local news, local political races, local community affairs, local sports, local traffic, and local weather reports. These include life-saving emergency weather updates like those we are doing around the clock on our Houston station, KRIV, as Hurricane Ike devastated Texas. Local broadcast television, free to the public, is uniquely American. The broadcast flag is the only solution to protect against the indiscriminate redistribution of local broadcast content, while at the same time protecting the television viewing experience. With the broadcast flag, people will continue to enjoy the ability to make multiple copies of their favorite television shows. They will continue to enjoy the flexibility of their home network, and they will continue to enjoy the features of every digital TV product that they have purchased to date. In conclusion, the broadcast flag will have no impact on the American public's legitimate enjoyment of broadcast television, while at the same time will help protect the future of free local television. Thank you once again for the opportunity to address this important matter. I, I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Mr. Chris Murray. Chris Murray is senior counsel to the Consumers Union, where he manages advocacy for consumer union on technology, communications, and media policy in the United States and internationally. You have five minutes, Mr. Murray. Madam Chairman Solis, uh, Representative Deal, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, thank you guys for your... Turn your mic on, please. I'd like to thank you for your extraordinary attention span today for sitting through uh, a, a long hearing. I would like to start with a story, a true story from a friend of mine uh, about John Smith, not his real name. He's a retired bus driver who lives in northeast Washington, D.C. Um, he watches his favorite football team, the Washington Redskins, on an over-the-air television. That's the only kind of television he has in his home, so he's going to need a converter box. Um, he doesn't have an internet connection. So my friend helped him order coupons and find a retailer near, near him, and the government's uh, printed information directed him to a radio shack, which was within walking distance. When he got there, he was surprised to hear the employee tell him that the only uh, box they were carrying in the entire D.C. metro area was $60, not $40 as he expected. He wasn't prepared to spend almost $50 uh, for two converters plus tax, uh, so he went home. My friend and I uh, tried to find another store in the D.C. area and came back empty-handed for a $40 box. His wife eventually went and bought the converters for more than $60 each. And sure, they got two converter boxes for $50 out of pocket, which is a lot better than the more than 100 it would have been without the coupon program. But that's still $50 just for them to keep their TVs working as they always uh, had been working. I'll come back to Mr. Smith, but I'd like to turn quickly to lessons learned from the DTV uh, transition test in Wilmington. Um, and I'd like to echo Chairman Martin's gratitude to Commissioner Copps for his uh, excellent plan for a test market in Wilmington. I think we have, it's yielded some valuable uh, information. We learned in the Wilmington test that there's more Americans who rely on over the air than we previously had imagined. In uh, Wilmington, Nielsen had put the number at 13 and a half thousand uh, over the air viewers. And what came back was that between 16 and 18 thousand Households said they rely on over-the-air and purchased a converter box. Now that means 
not only did every single last over-the-air viewer in that market get a converter box, but another 20 to 35 percent also said they relied on uh, over-the-air and got a converter box. So we should expect, I think, a big increase in demand. We should expect a, a, a spike as we near the end of the transition. And frankly, if the transition has an Oprah moment, I think that's by definition a good thing. We really want people to be sensitized to this, that this is happening. We want them to know that if they're an over-the-air family and they don't get a converter box, their television is going to turn into a brick. Um, I, my uh, colleague, Dr. Book, has an excellent idea that we would like to second for a series of national blinkouts, basically taking five minutes uh, out of popular programming to say, here's where you can go for information about the transition if you need it. Uh, the program, that, the, the problem that we were um, most interested in today was that the least expensive converter boxes aren't always making it to electronics retailer shelves, as I noted with uh, Mr. Smith. When our magazine, Consumer Reports, tested 24 DTV boxes, we found little variance in picture quality. Um, and features. In other words, we recommended that consumers buy the less expensive box, but the problem is they're just not widely available. Um, we have one electronics retailer who announced a $40, uh, excuse me, man manufacturer who announced a $40 converter box and is selling that direct to consumers, um, but we're not seeing it in stores. In a country where 25 million of these boxes are likely to be purchased, why is it that we're not seeing the less expensive options? Um, we hope that the committee would use its bully pulpit and ensure that consumers have these less expensive choices. We're also hearing complaints about cable providers taking channels out of basic tiers and moving them into the more expensive digital tier under the cover of the DTV transition, which forces consumers to buy uh, a more expensive package to get identical service. When consumers pay for the same service at a different, excuse me, when consumers pay more for the same service, it's a rate hike, and at $10 per set per month, uh, in some cases, it's $5, $6 in other cases, this hike is not minor. And with the DTV transition already confusing consumers, we feel that the timing, the timing of the industry's rate hike is deceptive. Um, I'm also concerned to hear Mr. Citos discuss the, the broadcast flag as uh, a solution to the DTV transition. We heard uh, Viacom in 2002 tell us that they wouldn't put HD programming over the air unless they got the broadcast flag. They didn't get it. That program eventually made it out there. I just I fear that this has long been a story of trying to um, restrict the innovative consumer electronics marketplace, and we would vigorously oppose any such proposals. Um, in conclusion, I'll just say that on February 17th, the U.S. is going to make the jump to digital. At that time, either millions of Americans will have been educated about exactly what they need to do to minimize transition hiccups, or millions of Americans will wake up to find that their TVs don't work anymore. I hope that we'll avoid the latter scenario, and I hope that we will uh, apply some serious pressure to get that done. Thank you very much for the time today. Thank you very much. Our uh, last witness is Dr. Connie L. Book. Um, Dr. Book is the Associate Dean of the School of Communications at Elon University in North Carolina. She serves on the board of the North Carolina Agency for Public Telecommunications and has conducted a wide array of research on broadcast communications issues. Thank you, and you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. We handled 172 calls that came into local television stations in the Time Warner Cable Call Center from noon to 10 p.m. on the day of the transition. Um, I brought a handful of bright and energetic Elon University students with me, and one of them is here today with me, Lauren Limerick, and she handled several calls gracefully and patiently that day. And so we're grateful for the opportunity to share some of what we learned in that process. When I was in the sixth grade, my sister Yvette, who was the pretty one in our family, was a huge fan of Elton John. ABC, which aired on Channel 33 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was scheduled to have a live concert. Unfortunately, we only had a VHF TV station. My dad, faced with five teenage girls, succumbed and on the day of the concert brought home a new color UHF TV set, raised the antenna, and bam, we had Elton. I remember my dad fooling with the TV to get the best signal, the concert, the big sunglasses, and the white leather suit. I start there this morning because that's where we are asking, that's what we are asking Americans to do on February 17, 2009. Not a hard task for my dad at the time because he had the means and the ability, but that's not the case for all Americans, and we don't want them to miss the concert. 
Today I'd like to share just a few of the lessons that we learned as part of our efforts in Wilmington. First, the information campaign in Wilmington was a hands-down success. Virtually everyone that faced disrupted signals and called knew about the transition and had purchased a converter box. The means employed by the FCC, local government, governments, broadcasters, and grassroots efforts uh, worked. The rest of the country will need to follow suit. And we asked people where they had heard the news about digital television, and most said, I heard it on TV. And TV can be used more effectively to help Americans make the transition. Prior to the switch on Monday, Wilmington conducted what I call a series of blinking tests, soft tests where they interrupt the analog program with a slate that says, if you're looking at this, you're not ready. They were 30 seconds, a minute, and were at different times of day. We would recommend that other markets in the U.S. start blinking that signal more frequently and during viewers' favorite programs. That may sound odd, but the truth is a viewer can forgive you for missing five minutes of their favorite program, but not the whole program. We learned that in Wilmington when phones heated up after Oprah Winfrey went on the air at 3 on Monday with the launch of her new fall season. Those viewers left with a slate telling them to call a 1-800 number or a county office weren't thinking too kindly of the digital TV mandate. Also, interrupting viewers' favorite program will create a sense of urgency that they need to get ready. In Wilmington, most of the callers had ordered and redeemed coupons for their digital converter boxes. Elon's students assessing the retail conditions found Walmart to be the primary point of purchase. When local residents went to Walmart and, and got that box, they did so from a shelf with a small typed up on white paper note saying the switch was scheduled for September 8th. Nothing fancy on a sh and on a shelf with lots of other products. More can be done at this point of sale. The primary issue with callers was not that the converter box wasn't working, but the antenna wasn't picking up signals. In Wilmington, analog signals sat on one tower and digital signals on another. People had to move their towers to receive the, move their antennas to receive the new UHF signals. Working with key retailers like Walmart, broadcasters should create documents that are visually heavy to walk through the local information needed to install the best antenna and to point it in the right direction. To do this, the local TV station engineering staff should be busy the next month testing signal strength at local points throughout their communities and creating one-page documents with neighborhood-level data. For example, we got calls from different pockets of Wilmington and residents would say, nobody on my street can get that signal. This street-level neighborhood data should be available at the point of purchase of DTV converter boxes. We recommend broadcasters get busy creating them. Even with a slate telling them to call the FCC, 172 Wilmington residents decided to call their local TV stations, a telephone number they probably had to look up in the phone book. A majority of these callers were elderly residents, and frequently there was someone calling on their behalf. People have a relationship with their local broadcaster, especially the older, often homebound. We would recommend, rather than a slate that directed viewers to call a 1-800 number, that stations use local talent to teach viewers experiencing problems what is necessary to acquire a signal. For example, Atlanta should have Monica Kaufman explain how to set up the converter box and antenna using a graphic. The Hispanic community should hear from local Spanish-speaking broadcasters at Univision or another station teaching them how to get their signal. These local uh, segments could be aired on continuous loops in the marketplace and give people a chance to solve their own problem rather than calling a 1-800 number. And if they do call, TV stations need to set up prototype viewing environments so that as callers work through issues with station volunteers or staff, they can have a visual in front of them to, to, uh, to, to look at what the caller is experiencing and more effectively walk through resolving the problems. You still will have hard-shaped cases, and in these, we need to create an emergency converter box. Thank you very much. Uh, before I turn to our uh, members for questioning, I want to request unanimous consent for three items. One is a press release and fact sheet concerning consumer awareness of the transition by the Consumer Electronics Association. Second, a letter from uh, Commissioner Copps, the FCC, to Chairman Martin concerning steps the FCC should take to prepare for the DTV transition, and then third, a letter sent by Chairman Martin to the Consumer Electronics Retailers Coalition regarding the availability of low-cost converter boxes. Uh, I request unanimous consent to submit these uh, for the record. 
Uh, and I would recognize uh, Congressman Gonzalez from Texas for a line of questioning. He has five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, the question is going to be to Dr. Book because you had mentioned something about making available an emergency converter box. Then your time was up. I'm not going to let you <laughs> get away with that. So what is an emergency converter box? Well, I was just trying to make the argument that there needs to be some system for hardship cases and that broadcasters should have either a, a supply of, broad, uh, of boxes on hand at the broadcast stations or retailers should be empowered to uh, provide a box to a hardship in, uh, case and know that they'll be reimbursed for that. So there needs to be some last resort so that people can solve people's problems. Yeah. Which I think is a good suggestion, and we need to start thinking in those terms. And so the, the next question kind of goes to that. Mr. McLean, I have a, I'm trying to figure out the relationship between the deadline and such. In your written testimony, you point out an important fact, and that's going to be applications for the coupons will be accepted up until what date? I think that and, and, 31st, if there is sufficient resources to be able to fill coupon requests. That and what, what was that date again? March 31st. All right. And then these coupons will have an expiration? 90 days. Of later. 90 days. So that conceivably people will still be going to the retailers to purchase these boxes all the way up until 90 days from whenever this coupon is issued so that the supply has to be out there. Now, I'm not a business person. Obviously, I'm in Congress, and if I was a business person, we'd probably be running the show a little differently. But inventory, are we going to have sufficient inventory? Because it seems to me that you're going to anticipate a surge of some sort, and like most surges, regardless of their application, uh, the surge is temporary as well as the consequence of that surge. So I, are, you going to be stock, are these retailers going to be stocking tremendous numbers of converters figuring that after February 17th and so on, that you're going to have a consistent high demand all the way 90 days after the March date? Our, I can report that our members are working very, very hard to assure that our customers have product available when they want it. But you've identified, I think, precisely the challenge here, because we are, we have no playbook. We have no prior program to look at. We have no future program. This is a once, once in a hundred years, once in a lifetime transition, one of unprecedented uh, complication, and one that is done on a free market basis where we have competitors unable to coordinate with each other uh, on price or availability. And you have, um, like in uh, Star Trek, where you have the multi-level chess game, where you have competitors in the marketplace moving product and price and supply in response to what other competitors are doing. We are analyzing the data from the coupon uh, redemptions and, uh, and, and fulfillments. We are looking at the data at uh, the Wilmington experiment. And uh, I know that the, um, the logistics and the buyers are studying that very hard to try to make the right decision. The big question is what happens when the coupon program ends? Do we have a product that suddenly, dis suddenly uh, is unpopular and we have you know, sh uh, shelves stocked with products that we cannot sell without a $40 coupon? So that's another piece of the puzzle that our buyers are trying to make independently, of course, of each other, and, and to make sure the customers are, are happy. So we're working very hard to make sure that we don't have a problem, but we are in uncharted territory in, in general, and uh, it's, it's going to take, I think, a high degree of data communication, which thankfully we received from uh, NTIA and the FCC and the broadcasters to make sure that we can make adjustments as we approach those two critical dates. And my fear is that we don't have that coordination as we get closer to it. And, and all I can say is it's what I'm saying in anticipation. We, don't, we had nothing about reissuance, and that's an issue that's been out there for some time. Underutilization, the number of boxes not being available, none of that. We really, 
I know there's a certain degree of success, but I'm saying I, I'm hope this is not true, but I, I think the real challenge still awaits us as we get closer to that date. So all I'm saying is let's just work together and try to give you as much predictability as possible so you retailers will have those boxes. Mr. Kittleman, I only have four seconds, but I want to cover quickly. Don't Spanish language TV stations have a totally different situation than your TV station? And that is they've got competitors you don't have, and they're right over the border that are going to continue to broadcast in analog. Is, should that be a concern? You're correct. They do compete directly with the Mexico channels. I would point out the largest station in Mexico, XERV, is already digital in our market. All right. And I'm out of time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Deal uh, from Georgia for five minutes. Thank you. I want to go to an issue that has already been alluded to, and that is the fact that a, a number of retransmission consent agreements are going to expire around the end of the year. And some cable operators, as we have heard Mr. McSclara uh, enunciate, are concerned that if the programming is simply pulled at the end of the year because of a failure to reach an agreement on retransmission, that there probably will be a confusion as to whether or not that actually is attributable to the DTV transition issue. Um, now, I have a quote from uh, NAB, and I'm going to ask Mr. Rear and Mr. McSclero if they would respond to this after I give you the quote and then ask you a question. And the quote is this. Many major broadcast events will occur in early 2009, think National Football League playoffs and Super Bowl, and that a quiet period longer than one month would shift significant negotiating leverage away from broadcasters to the multi-channel video providers, and without a resulting benefit to the public that could justify such a government thumb on the scale." End of quote. Now, my question is, and this is attributable to uh, NAB from uh, a publication, Broadcasting Cable, question is this, what significant negotiating leverage is NAB referring to? Do you believe that the broadcaster's uh, own admission of having significant negotiating leverage is due to government-created rules, whereby they have the leverage of must carry and the retransmission consent regulatory regime and the significant negotiating leverage created by cable operators not being allowed to shop the broadcast signals from neighboring DMAs, or is it simply a natural result of the so-called free market system? Um, Mr. Rear, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to Mr. McSclara. Thank you, Mr. Deal, for that question. I would like to, and I brought with me, and I would like to put into the record an explanation of the retransmission consent process. This hearing is about the DTV transition. We can get into the quiet period relating to it, but I think it will answer a number of concerns. Uh, let me make just a couple points. Uh, number one, the retransmission consent law has been in effect since 1992. That means that there have been five cycles of tens of thousands of contracts, agreements, between cable and satellite operators and broadcasters. Uh, you can count the number of problems where there hasn't been some accommodation by all sides less than the number of fingers on my hand. So if we're looking at is it going to be a big problem, and we multiply five cycles, which is probably in the upwards of 30 to 40,000 contracts, less than 10 problems, uh, that would give the uh, kind of the uh, weight of significance to a potential problem. Number two, Congress wisely built in checks and balances since 1992. For example, the FCC does have a right if either party, not just broadcasters but cable operators as well, are not operating in good faith. There has only been one occasion when the FCC has said a party has not been negotiating in good faith, and it wasn't a broadcaster. It was a satellite distributor. The FCC has never found a broadcaster not operating in good faith. Point number three, local communities see the benefits of this local programming and this retransmission process, and I have a great respect and a great admiration for my good friend Kyle McSlero, but uh, broadcasters, local broadcasters, have to choose for three years must carry or retransmission consent. Once you choose retransmission consent, there are a number of variables on the table which are at negotiation with uh, cable operators, including program insertion options, spot sales, fiber runs between transmitters and head ends, promotion spot guarantees, channel position, 
tier placement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all outlined in this kind of what I refer to as the candy land way to understand retransmission consent. I apologize for interrupting you, but I'm down to less than a minute. Let me use that for Mr. Okay. McClara to, to respond. I don't, I don't think this is a matter of good faith. I think this is the structure of the system. People in good faith can reach a result that harms consumers. And, and it's different in 2008, and it's increasingly becoming different, I think, in the out years from the way it's been the last 15 years. The, the economics and the balance of leverage, if you will, was roughly equivalent for many years. And I think, as David said, in most cases, people can work it out in a way that serves consumers' interests. But you are now talking about public statements from what used to be, and remember, every broadcaster here has said it today, free over the air. You're now talking about exorbitant cash demands that are going to change uh, the, that balance and put operators who stand in the shoes of their consumers in the position of having to either pass that cost on or to insist that it be something lower, which is what raises the threat of pulling the signal. The quote that you just read, uh, assuming that, that is an accurate quote, I think tells the story. The point is, if you were saying we have a retransmission agreement that expires December 31st, what would just get us through the digital transition? Can you sum up real yes. quick? <laughs> you would naturally just say, take it from that point through the transition. The fact that they have chosen January as a carve-out is precisely because some stations, some broadcasters would like to threaten the loss of signals. That's the risk of confusion. Okay. Thank you. Our time is almost up, but I still have uh, five minutes, so I want to go through my question. But I want to just make a comment to uh, Mr. Rear, Mr. McSlarrow, uh, and others who have really worked with the Congress and the different entities in helping to bring about more awareness for the transition, particularly in the Spanish language media and the senior citizen and, and those different uh, segments of our population. I, I really think that's great. But one of my questions still remains. Um, how, do we get, uh, how do we get the retailers to provide sufficient uh, boxes there that are needed, that are, that are uh, at a low cost, uh, preferably for many folks that can't afford them? And what is it going to take to make that happen? Um, those are, that's a question I have generally for Mr. Romeo. But I want to I hold off a minute because I want to go to Mr. Candelaria. Um, you, you come from uh, Texas, the area that may be affected more heavily in a different way regarding the transition here. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, what has, what has been your um, feeling or what, what are you picking up out there in terms of the information that's getting out to the Hispanic community about the transition? Well, the, the information is, uh, is getting out there, but not to the, to the rate that we would like for it to get out there. And the, and the simple barrier here is, is the Spanish language. You have uh, over 310,000 people in, just in El Paso, in the Paso Diome alone, that are Spanish language dominant, they're not getting the information that they need on a regular basis. Or very, I mean, they're watching our station, but that's, that's the difference between us and the English language stations. Had their, um, if, if their language was Spanish or at least bilingual, then this wouldn't be an issue. This wouldn't even be a question anymore, and there wouldn't be a fight. What, what about the uh, issue regarding your opponents that say that four years is too long and is actually going to be a cost uh, that will be a burden on, on uh, many that, are, that, are, that will be affected by this? Well, it's only a burden if, if they choose to continue in analog, but it's only optional. We're, it's our, we, we have the same expense they do. We've, we've converted, and our expenses are that much or more than any of the broadcast stations simply because of what we have. But... The, the transition is, is we're asking for four years just to appease uh, certain people, and, and uh, I think that, that that will give us enough time at least to, to get the majority of the Hispanic population uh, in, in compliance. Could you touch on the public safety aspect issue? Well, yeah. I mean, there's in El Paso alone, we had the 100-year flood a couple of years ago, and uh, there was literally houses underwater in El Paso, imagine. <laughs> And w without our broadcasting signal and strength, uh, there were a lot of people that, that could have perished. Um, and, and just the simple fact that, you know, national disaster, uh, you have the, the, border, the border war over there where, in Juarez where it's starting to spill over into El Paso where there's way over 1,000 people that have been killed in Mexico alone. And, and it's, right. it, it's, it's, a, it's a disaster that is just waiting to spill over to the, to the U.S. side of the border. 
And that's the concern. Just, just to mention a few things uh, that we are uh, gravely concerned about as far as uh, our, our public safety. I wanted to ask you about advertising revenues uh, for local affiliates. Uh, that's an important part of this debate. Uh, if tens of thousands of Spanish-dominant households opt to watch Mexican analog TV instead of purchasing a converter box to transition to U.S.-based digital television, advertising revenue for both English language and Spanish language border stations based in the U.S. would undoubtedly be impacted. Um, specifically, how would a large drop-off of Spanish-dominant viewers in the border region affect revenue for both Eng English and Spanish language affiliates? Well, the, the shift, right now our station is the, the leading station in the market, both in revenue and in ratings. And a lot of the uh, over-the-air over uh, 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 signals that are predominantly Hispanic, Spanish-dominant uh, households um, receive that just through over the airways. And, and the problem here is, is that there, will be a, there would be a shift because it's a diary-rated market, and that shift would go away to the Spanish-language uh, Mexican stations simply because they're broadcasting in analog, where everybody else is broadcasting. Dis disadvantaging some it's of our folks It's a total disadvantage, and, and the shift would go to the English stations. Just one last question. Um, we talked about the expiration of the coupons, and if this program, this bill were to be signed, uh, obviously there would have to be a whole new mechanism set up for something like that. Do you think that, how would you see something like that working? Well, it's got to be, it's got to be promoted well, and it's got, there's got to be an extension on the, on the couponing. Uh, and we are, you know, we're over delivering our, uh, our, our, our redemption rate in El Paso to the tune of about 240 percent. So I think with a little bit more time, and that's all we're asking is just a little bit more time to consistently promote, then we can foreseeably get the majority of the Hispanic population on board. And you're saying opting in is yeah. kind of a key word here that people need to know about. Okay, I think my, well. We will recess momentarily for uh, the chairman to come back. He's on his way back here to the committee, and I have to go vote. So we'll recess momentarily. Thank you to all the witnesses, by the way. The, uh, the hearing is uh, reconvened with uh, apologies to um, uh, our panel. Uh, just for the uh, purposes of understanding what's going on, we do not have a filibuster rule in the House of Representatives, so you cannot filibuster. However, you can call any number of irrelevant uh, roll calls to adjourn and do many other things, which is a substitute for what actually makes filibustering look rational, okay? And so that is what we are now engaged in out on the House floor and why the members have been running in and out, uh, like it's the, um, you know, the 400-meter uh, relay in the Olympics, and we just hope no one drops the gavel here on the Democratic side so that we're not uh, disqualified. Uh, and we uh, are trying our best here to be respectful of the panel and. We appreciate all of the effort that you've made to be here and to present your um, uh, testimony. So, uh, Mr. McLean, uh, how can we get uh, retailers to stock uh, more of the uh, $40 analog pass-through um, uh, devices so that uh, consumers can watch this brand new technology? Well, our, our members have uh, worked extraordinarily hard to get uh, products into the um, shelves. Uh, when, when they go to market individually and independently um, to purchase products, they have to be able to buy it at a, at a scale that could fill hundreds of, of stores. And uh, it's a complex um, matrix of, of uh, features and price points and quality and returns uh, that the retailers have to make. Um, our council has done a, a survey of online um, suppliers and has identified uh, the $40 box available um, online. <coughs> and, um, but we have found that, uh, um, you know, the, the supply chain issues that we faced at our last hearing 
uh, were, were, were very severe, and it required um, rapid action, um, and ex in some cases, extraordinary absorption of costs in order to be able to get pass-through boxes onto shelves. Uh, among our members, they've had to incur costs for air freighting uh, the pass-through products. Uh, there's been tremendous amount of training and point-of-sale requirements in complying with the program. Um, as a coalition of competitors, uh, we cannot do any kind of coordination on price or, or product. Um, so each one of our members are making individual decisions. I will uh, let the chairman know, however, with the uh, Chairman Martin's letter introduced into the <coughs> record today and published on the web uh, last night, every one of our members is aware of uh, Chairman Martin's uh, request about the $40 box. Okay, and we're going to have a, a really, really uh, difficult situation along the border. And uh, what do you need in order to ensure that all of the companies are cooperating at the point at which that becomes a much more urgent matter? What, yes. what do you need from us? Do you need, a, do you need an antitrust exemption for that purpose? Uh, do you need something that uh, we can uh, uh, make uh, legal for a temporary peri uh, period of time in order to deal with a specific um, uh, situation? Because I, I would like to be able to find a way in which we can authorize all of you to go into one room uh, and then all of you are responsible uh, for putting together a plan uh, and then we can hold you all accountable uh, if something goes wrong, uh -huh. uh, other than, rather than saying, well, we didn't have stores here, there, or the other place, okay? So do you need an antitrust exemption? Well, our members have, of course, accepted the premise of the program itself, which did not... No, that's great. No, that's great. And, and, but I and just don't like the fact that you're not able to, you know, talk to each other comfortably, if that's what I'm picking up from your testimony. Well, we certainly, under the current law, cannot coordinate price product selection, terms of sale. It's absolutely prohibited on a coordinated basis. Um, in terms of the border, I can tell you that uh, each one of our members is going to extraordinary lengths to be able to have uh, Spanish language and English language uh, uh, availability of information. Um, there's installation videos available in Spanish. Uh, there's tremendous outreach through the DTV coalition into a uh, Hispanic community in order to be able to put forward the um, urgency of conversion. And in fact, the polling uh, validates that among the highest level of awareness is in the Hispanic community. Okay. So they can't talk to each other, though. Can they talk to you? Can each company talk to you? Companies do. Can talk each company to talk to you? And there are things I cannot tell other companies. Exactly. But you can know everything, though. Is that right? <laughs> Is that the, that's the point I'm trying to reach. You can know everything, even if you can't share it with the other companies? Uh, Council advises me that um, there may, I may not be able to know everything. I certainly would not pretend to know everything. No, every, how but, about but this? I, if we asked you the questions that we want to have answered, could you ask each one of the companies to tell you what the answers to those questions are, and then could you tell us? Would that violate any law? Yeah, it depends. Again, council advised me. It depends on, on, on the subject matter. Uh, yeah, we'll report saying. to you. Yeah. However, that is precisely how we <clears throat> prepared our testimony today. Is no, but I, I want you then to share the specifics with us, and then we'll know who to really uh, come right. down hard on. So, uh, so it, does that violate anything that you can then tell us, and then, then uh, we'll know who you think isn't doing the job. And if you tell us everyone's doing the job, then we can rely upon you to be the person who's determined that they're all doing the job. Can, can we construct something like that? I, I, can, I can certainly report to you that uh, each one of our members uh, is working very hard. No, I know that, I know that. But I'm um, saying, so what, what, what I would like to do here is to make sure that it's, it's coordinated to the maximum extent possible so that there are companies getting an A, in your opinion, a B, not generally, Generally, a class is doing very well, but there's a first yeah. row and a last row, and then and it averages actually, out to a grade in the middle. Okay, yes, so and, I just want to know who's getting the A's, you could kind of tell well, us, and, and who's and, in the last row, and then yes. we can coordinate to get Mr. Candelaria well, down here a little bit more comfort that the stores are going to have, we've got to know who's yes. not doing the job. Well, and, and, you know, Mr. Chairman, um, 
your your um, only that's analogy. The way the, that's the way the, 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 the classroom the, is exactly perfect because the some of my class members um, excel in certain exactly. areas and others excel in others, and yet they are not coordinated in any way. Uh, we have some members that are online retailers, some members that have telephone services, some lines, that, uh, some members that are exclusively consumer electronics, and some members that are general retailers. Um, I appreciate that. Just, you know, the nuns at the Immaculate Conception Grammar School, we had 60 boys in the room and there were yes, sir. Six, six rows <laughs> of ten apiece. Okay? It was the first row and a last row, if you know what I mean. And in the last row, sister would always let them know what they needed to do to get out of the last row. Yes. Okay. But you needed first to know who was in the last yes. row. Huh? And she had a high expectations for them because she re really wanted them to maximize all their yes. God-given abilities. But um, it wasn't as though uh, there was some uh, charitable attitude that there was an average here in the middle that they could benefit from. Okay. So all I'm saying to you is, and we're going to right. press you on this yes, and sir. then hold you accountable, Yes, sir. Um, that we're going to use you as an intermediary to ensure that there's accountability. So if during that period of time which has more urgency, something has gone wrong, okay, that you will have had the ability to know I, the uh, right. And 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 we our ability to inquire okay, well. on uh, price and product plans okay. is limited. I do not want to be sent to Mother Superior's office uh, <clears throat> as a result of those inquiries. <laughs> not from my personal experience. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> something you. something to be avoided. Uh, Mr. Cetos, uh, your testimony paints the uh, broadcast flag as pro-consumer and you're sitting next to uh, Mr. Murray who differs as a consumer advocate. Could you tell me succinctly <clears throat> why you think he's mistaken and then Mr. Murray if you could respond, uh, Mr. Cetos. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh Chairman, um, the, um, the challenge we face, and I sit here not as a producer uh, of a movie studio, uh, not as a broadcast network, but as the uh, operator of 27 full power local broadcast stations. And, it's, and, and many corporations are operated like this. The local broadcast stations are very concerned, the ones that, that, we, that we own and operate, that um, th they will not be able to compete for high quality, high value content in the coming years. Uh, because their content can now be absconded with and transmitted all over the world um, uh, in digital, pure, high-definition form um, with impunity. And, and, uh, no other, and other platforms, such as uh, pay television operators uh, like cable, satellite, telcos, even on the Internet like iTunes, um, ensure that the content uh, is only used uh, as, as the official bargain to the consumer, so states. And so those local broadcasters are saying to, to their own company, um, we're very exposed, we're very concerned. And so the, 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 the benefit that it brings is, as I said in my testimony, it, it, makes, it, it continues the promise of free local television in the market. Um, on the, on the, on the um, other side of the equation is what harm might this cause? Uh, and as, as I've uh, mentioned in this testimony and previous testimonies, the flag doesn't add any cost to the product, uh, nor any limitations to the product, nor any does it obsolete any product that was ever sold to a consumer or, or probably is going to be sold to a consumer. So we see no downside except what, what, the, what the rule that the Commission did pass, in fact, ensures that products that, that see the flag in a broadcast uh, won't allow that content to be indiscriminately redistributed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Murray. I come at this as a big believer in innovation and competition. I think that we're better suited by uh, if, if we turn the Federal Communications Commission into the Federal Computer Commission and have them have purview over a series of consumer electronics products and let have to have companies vet business plans through the agency, I, I think that's ill-suited to innovation and ill-suited to uh, strong competition. I don't see uh, revenues eroding rapidly. In fact, some have made the case that uh, market share is, is growing because of additional content distribution. We're not saying people shouldn't be able to protect their products. We just don't think that they should be able to fob off a mandate on the whole of the consumer electronics industry uh, to get that done. We, we've been through this. Um, a court threw out the broadcast flag. We thought it was anti-consumer then. We think it's anti-consumer now. You could talk back to you, Mr. Zitos, 30 seconds. Well, the court threw it out because uh, it, it pointed out, the, ju the judicial branch pointed out that the, that the FCC didn't have the jurisdiction, not on the merits, not on the substance. Okay, back to you, Mr. Murray. 
Well, uh, right. The FCC doesn't have jurisdiction, I think, to be regulating consumer electronics products of, of, of give a, a mandate to uh, manufacturers. The story of the motion picture industry has been a uh, uh, struggle to lock down technology since the 1980s. We heard from them then that the, the VCR was to um, the motion picture industry as the Boston Strangler is to the woman alone. And of course, it, the, the end of that story was that it became the most lucrative slice of their copyright pie. Um, but you know, had we locked that technology down then, I don't think we would have seen all of the benefits of innovation that we've seen over the last 20 years. Okay, well, thank you. We thank uh, each of you. Uh, the roll call did go off uh, one more time, and there is five minutes left to go on the House floor for that roll call. So um, I, th I think I can uh, report to you that uh, a sense of relief can set in down at the witness table that no members of Congress will return here to ask you any more <laughs> questions. So um, it is with uh, the thanks of the committee uh, that, um, uh, and we know that everyone here is interested in a solution, okay? And we just have to make sure um, that everyone else that um, is related to each one of the entities that <clears throat> Uh, is represented down here has the same sense of commitment, and that's really our highest goal. We think we can do this, but we absolutely have to have a plan because uh, the consequences could be catastrophic. Thank you so much. The hearing is adjourned. Later today, the Senate plans to finish work on the almost $613 billion defense programs bill. This after continued disagreement over how to proceed with earmarks in the bill. The measure